right, so uh, may I take this opportunity to uh, give everybody a very warm welcome, uh, especially to our esteemed faculty who is uh, participating from different parts of the world. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, thank you so much for being part of uh, iTrue's webinar, which is STENTS, the lifeline of Urology. It's been my pleasure to uh, be a convener as well as moderate the session with Professor Vaskar Somani and Dr. Zishan Ahmed. Zishan Hamid is an assistant professor in Manipal, and uh, he's doing the arduous task of um, sitting here and then looking and interestedly asking you all the questions that are going to be pouring in from everywhere. We already have uh, a fantastic number of participants having registered. So uh, a warm welcome to you. I'd like to especially thank my friends Zimin and Lebanon. I hope you guys are safe. So uh, our wishes are with you. And uh, hopefully all our viewers who have logged in, uh, thank you so much and hope you're safe during COVID times. And uh, thank you, Professor Basker, for uh, being the support and the backbone of this. And without further ado, can I pass on the uh, you know, stage to Zishan, if you could kindly introduce all our fa faculty from everywhere today. The registration link up. Good afternoon, Vineet. A very good, a very good evening, and warm greetings on behalf of uh, iTru. Let me introduce our moderators. I have the pleasure to introduce our uh, moderator, Professor Bhaskar Somani. He is the president of Petra Group, president of iTru Group, and the coordinator for Europe Hands-On Training Program. He is also an active member of European School of Urology, European School of Urology Technology. He has more than four hundred and chapters in urology books. I would like to introduce Dr. Vinith Gohar, the convener and moderator for today's webinar. Dr. Vinith is a member of iTru Group and he is a well-known person in the digital media. He has organized numerous webinars and conferences. He is an avid teacher and fantastic orator. We have expert faculty from India, UK, Saudi Arabia, Canada, Italy, Israel, and who have done immense work in the field of double J strengths and innovations and its applications. They will be sharing their insights on various topics. Dr. Ben Chu is the Associate Professor of Urology at University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada. He is also the Director of the Clinical Research at the Stone Center at Vancouver General Hospital. He is also the Chair of Research for the Endourological Society. He is a member of EDGE Research Consortium and the Wisconsin Quality of Life Research Consortium. Dr. Chu has done a lot of research in the area of stent biomaterials. Dr. Rishi Joshi is a consultant urological surgeon and honorary lecturer at University Hospital of Wales and Cardiff, UK. He is credited with design, development, and validation of widely used USSQ questionnaire, which is Uretic Stent Symptom Questionnaire. It is one of the widely cited articles which was published earlier in 2000. He has received numerous grants and contributed to chapters in uretic stents. Dr. Nikita Butt is the specialist registrar at East of England, Danary, United Kingdom. She is a committee member of the British Urological Research in Surgical Training, which stands for BURST, an associate panel member on the EAU Pediatric Urology Panel, associate on the UAU Guidelines Social Media Panel, and a BURST representative on the BAUS Endourological Committee. Dr. Arvind Ganpule is the Vice Chairman, Department of Urology and Chief of Laparoscopic and Robotic Surgery at MPUS Nadiad, India. He is the Chairman of the Endurological and Stone Subspeciality of Urology Society of India. He has contributed various chapters, especially in 12th edition of Campbell Walsh Textbook of Urology, Hinman's Atlas, Smith Endourology, and many other urology textbooks. He has authored more than 200 peer review publications and has three patents to his name. He has received various awards and also serves in the editorial board of various international journals. Dr. Saeed bin Hamri is the consultant at National Health Guard Affairs, Saudi Arabia. He is the founding member of International Petra Group and head of Saudi Endourological Society. His main interest is in minimal invasive surgery, flexible electroscopy, and laser therapy. He participated in many bilingual international conferences presenting more than 300 scientific presentations. He was honored in 2011 for his participation to develop new products in endourology and laser lithotripsy. Dr. Mario Sofer is the Associate Professor of Urology, Director of Endourology at TASMC Tel Aviv, Israel. Dr. Sofer is a permanent reviewer for leading urological journals and is appointed in the Board of Reviewers for Central European Journal of Urology. He is the author for more than 
100 peer review published party uh, papers as well as book chapters his main interests are treatment of upper upper unit <laughs> He performed more than 4,000 surgical oncological and endocrinologic lab laparoscopic procedures as chief surgeon. He has various publications in medical journals and contributed two chapters in medical books and four scientific videos. We are grateful to Blooming Medical Devices for the collaboration and Swan in Touch for providing us the technical support right. for this event. I said thank you for the wonderful introduction. Uh, though it, you know most people are well known, it is an honor and a pleasure to please invite uh, Professor Ben Chu, who will uh, inaugurate this session. We we'll talk about stents and biomaterials. Uh, on to you, Professor Ben. Thank you very much for this invitation. I really appreciate it. So I do work for some companies. I'm also the chair of research for the Endourology Society, which I think is the, one of the premier societies internationally for stones as well as robotics. So I encourage you to join if you already have not. And that meeting is one of my favorite meetings. So I'm here to talk about stents. This is something near and dear to my heart. We all know that the ideal stent really probably doesn't exist because we need all of these things yet our patients have a lot of discomfort or we get incrustation and infection. And there are multiple, multiple stents. This is just some of them that are available in some of the bigger markets, but there's multiple other ones from many smaller companies as well too. So what kind of materials are there available? Well, so far there are many materials and many blends of polymers, but polyethylene used to be used in the past, but it was too brittle and it would actually break down and actually fracture. Silicone is a very biocompatible material. And then there's all these proprietary blends. So I'm gonna talk just a little bit about some of this material in the past. Polyurethane is one of the most commonest base materials in today's stents. And it's used in many, many other things, such as foam, um, a lot of industrial things, carpet, many, many other things. So, but what's the problem with pure polyurethane stents? Well, they can actually fracture. This is a study that was published about eight years ago. And if you have infections, and if they've been in for quite a long time, they can actually uh, break and actually fracture. And here's just some x-rays of that happening. And they, the, the problem with this material is it's just very brittle, particularly when it's left in for a long time and if the pH changes. So what about polyurethane? There was a study done in 1988, and this was a, a very famous study, but it really hasn't um, been replicated yet. They looked at a whole bunch of different materials and they did it inside of uh, dog ureters. And they actually found that there was a lot of epithelial ulceration and erosion as well too. So we all are no strangers to these problems that patients get with incrustation and infection and, and, and pain. What about pain? So what about stent design? Simple thing, what about size? A 4.7 versus a six or a seven. And they used uh, Mr. Joshi's uh, ureteral stent symptom questionnaire, USSQ. And what they found was that the 4.7 French stents actually had less symptoms than the other stents did. And if you're wondering whether or not it still caused dilation of the ureter, if you're going in for a secondary ureteroscopy, there was still very good dilation of the ureter, even with the smaller stent. Another study showed that, uh, this is just done last year, six French versus 4.7 French stents. The larger stents actually had worse symptom scores in terms of urinary symptoms and urinary voiding, and the 4.7 French stent actually did much better. Now, how about removing the stents? How do patients prefer to remove this? This study looked at whether or not they really would prefer a cystoscopy versus an extraction string. And the extraction string and doing it at home was actually the best way of doing it rather than doing a cystoscopy. So I think this is a nice way to do it. I leave about 90% of my patients with an extraction string. Um, if they're infected or other reasons or strictures, then I don't want to leave it. But certainly I think this is my preferred method of removal. How long should you leave a stent in? I often get asked this question and there's really very little data until this study came out. They looked at patients versus three days versus seven days. And then they looked at symptom scores. And what they found that you thought, or you would think that if you left it in for a shorter amount of time, that patients would actually feel better. But that's actually not true. Um, in fact, seven day patients actually did better. They ended up uh, having less pain and coming back to the emergency department a lot less. 
And I think there is a good reason for this. We've done many stent studies in pigs, and what we've found is that they actually have uh, something happens around the 72 hour mark. So this does make sense. I think if you take it out after three days, I think there's still a lot of edema and a lot of irritation going on. So certainly I leave mine in for five days. That's not based on anything. Um, but I think seven days here, this evidence shows that this is actually a lot better. What about the positioning of the stent? The, if you leave it in uh, on, on A here, where it is not crossing the midline or whether it just crosses midline or right across the midline, certainly they found that there was less sexual symptoms if it did not cross the midline. And what they actually found that it was actually no difference in the positioning and did not affect the stent symptoms. So the best way probably to measure stent length is to take the CT height, just go vertically right down from the uretal vesicle junction right up to the kidney and then add 20% for that uh, anterior posterior portion. So what about differences in stents? This is a uh, new type of not commercially available stent yet, where they would take a stent, cut it and attach a string to it so that there was very little material inside the bladder. In essence, it was actually just a, uh, a string, a suture string. And what they found with these patients in the blue was that they actually had much less analgesic use on uh, post-op three to 14 and their visual analog scale was also much better as well too. So this has been commercialized um, in a stent called the mini J fill. And what this is, is, is exactly that. It's basically a renal coil, and this is what it looks like on x-ray, but then it is basically a polypropylene suture, or basically a monofilament suture that goes all the way down into the bladder, and that's how you extract it. And um, these, this uh, group in France did it, and you notice that patients still had ureteral dilation. And the nice thing about this compared to regular polymer stents is I think there's a lot more room in the ureter, so fragments could still pass after shockwave lithotripsy. If you reduce the material a little bit less and just use loop uh, tail ureteral stents, they actually found that if they did not cross the midline, that these patients had less bladder symptoms with the loop stents. Now, how about silicone? Silicone traditionally before was a little bit more difficult to implant because you needed a lot more material to get the axial rigidity in order to insert it up. Well, uh, the, also the, the, the uh, inner lumen was really quite small because you needed quite a thick stent. Coloplast has come up with a new stent called Imogen where they've sort of really been able to stabilize the silicone and make it more rigid. And therefore it's still very soft. So insertion is actually a lot easier than the previous generation of silicone stents. And these patients actually tolerated it very well and better than a Percuflex Plus stent from Boston Scientific in, in certain scores. Now, this is a example of a stent discoloration. These are two types of Boston scientific stents, the Percuflex Plus. And this led to a study in Japan, sort of looking at this discoloration. And we actually did a study, myself and Dirk Lang, who's a PhD at my center, who is uh, in charge of the basic science and stents, looked at whether or not these actually made a difference. Why did they encrust and did this affect its ability to either, uh, excuse me, why did they discolor? And did they encrust or did they actually get more bacterial adhesion? And using EDX, what we actually found was that it's actually the bismuth in the material which makes it radiopaque that actually reacted with um, sulfides, making a bismuth sulfide. So sulfide in the urine with bismuth bicarbonate in the stent produced bismuth sulfide, which turns it black. So this stent, so, so uh, discoloration, we then tested it to see, does it encrust more? Is there more bacterial adhesion? And I'm not showing that data, but we did not find that at all. So this was purely a cosmetic thing. They turned black, but there was no increase in stent associated complications. Boston Scientific took this data, and despite the fact that there was no clinical difference in them, they still de designed a new stent that had what they ca called a percu shield. Essentially what it is is a trilayer design. So it has this um, material on both the out outer lumen and the inner lumen. And what it does is it prevents the urine from getting 
to the bismuth bicarbonate, which is the radial pacifier. Therefore, these stents um, do not discolor. But this is the newest stent that's come up from Boston Scientific. They have both a firm and a soft version. So look for this in your areas. We're uh, doing a study on this now to see whether or not this is more comfortable and how it is in terms of incrustation. Now, what about trying to reduce symptoms by trying to reduce uh, reflux? This is a, there's many kind of ref, anti-reflux stents that have been available, but I don't think any that are used uh, widely. This is one that basically has a valve on it. So when the bladder does generate pressure, no urine will go back up. And when you look at ultrasounds of patients, they have no hydronephrosis compared to a conventional stent on the top. And they did this in 105 patients, and patients had certainly less pain with urination with this kind of material. There's a lot of other kind of anti-reflux stents. This is one that was actually 3D printed from a Korean group on the end of a stent. So they actually just took a regular stent and 3D printed this valve. So when the pressure does get larger, it actually just closes the, the bottom end so that therefore you don't get reflux up into the kidney. This is Dirk Lang, who I was telling you about late, earlier, who has a, a PhD and he runs our basic science lab portion here at Vancouver General Hospital. And we've been working on a degradable stent. So instead of having to worry about when to take the stent out, this is a material that essentially is like a vicral suture. It is made up of glycolide, caprolactone, and uh, poly L uh, glycolic acid. And what it does is it basically degrades over time. And in animal studies, the first one we did degraded between seven to 10 weeks, and then we finally got one to degrade between three to four weeks. In terms of the hydronephrosis, there's much less hydronephrosis in pigs, at least, with this stent compared to regular polymer stents. And in terms of the biocompatibility, you actually saw a lot less inflammation when you looked at the inflammation of the ureter and the kidney of these pigs. We were able to do a small first in human study. You can see the stent here, uh, and it's quite radiopaque. And we wanted just to make sure that they all degraded. They didn't have to come back to hospital and get a regular stent put in. We did a very brief cursory pain and symptom questionnaire. And this is a gentleman who has a six millimeter stone at the distal left at UVJ. And we did the ureteroscopy, put the stent up, and here's the stent at week two. You can see it there, draining quite nicely. No changes in creatinine. Pain was quite well tolerated. By week three, the stent had completely degraded. So we did a very small study, eight patients. All stents dissolved completely, which was great. The longest one took five weeks, but most of them dissolved within three weeks. So the patients were quite comfortable. So we're still waiting to uh, do a more definitive larger study. This is awaiting FDA approval right now. We've made some alterations to the stent. So the more definitive uh, surgery, or excuse me, more definitive trial will be coming out uh, next year. Now, what about other things we can do to existing stents? So PU or polyurethane stents, you can actually put a polyethylene uh, I mean brush on it to basically inhibit incrustation on ureteral stents. So basically you attach this brush to coating to it and then you can actually alkylate it. And inside of in vitro testing, as well as inside of rat bladders, when you infect them, this is just a control stent and under scanning electron microscopy, you can see the kind of incrustation you can get here. But on this stent that has the polyethylene I mean, uh, brush coating, you actually see nothing. So this is a very interesting article. And we've actually done very similar things here too with Dirk Lang and myself with a group here at University of British Columbia, where we took a brush coating with antimicrobial peptides, which are essentially short polypeptide chains, otherwise known as nature's antibiotics. And we've actually tested that inside of rats. And this is a study where we actually gave them a GFP uh, and then done a Lumix kind of um, testing to see how much bacteria is there. And on uh, day one and day seven, you can actually see that the antimicrobial peptides actually did much better and they had much less growth of bacteria when you put that kind of brush coating and the peptides on there. So, and then when you take the catheter surface, there's actually virtually no bacteria growing on it when you have antimicrobial peptide and very little growing in the urine compared to controls. 
So Dirk Lang has actually taken this further and you know how muscles can attach to basically anything. So their glue is actually polydopamine. So Dirk has taken polydopamine and used this to attach the antimicrobial peptides to, to Foley catheters. And it's a very simple, easy process. It doesn't cost a lot. It's a simple dipping process. So he can basically take the polydopamine, cross-link it to the antimicrobial peptide. And even when you replace bacteria on a daily basis into this in vitro test tube, up to 21 days, there's still virtually no growth of bacteria on the coated catheters. So we're looking to do this on your reader stents at some point as well too. Now this is work, I wanna get into a bit of our translational science work. We want to, instead of just sort of developing new materials, we wanna understand what happens to the urinary system. Why do patients get pain, why do they get this dilation? So we use the pig model and you can see there's quite a bit of dilation at 48 hours. And this is what I was talking about earlier with the three versus seven days. And at seven days stent, you can see there's even more dilation. So what is it that actually causes this dilation and does it relate to the pain? So Dirk has actually talked about GLEE-1 expression in stented and unstented ureters, and he's working on the hedgehog signaling pathway to understand what this is. And perhaps we can either develop a drug-eluting stent or even medications to try and reduce stents, or even just giving medications instead to prevent from having to use a stent in the first place if we can control ureteral dilation. We all know about erythropoietin and how it can cause blood doping for athletes to increase their amount of hemoglobin, but it also can actually increase um, ureteral smooth muscle function. So Dr. Lang did a study looking at EPO given to mice where we actually um, temporarily obstruct their ureter. And what you can see here is that when you obstruct their ureter, give them EPO, and then take off the obstruction, the return from hydronephrosis is much faster in the EPO group than it is in the control group. And it's also much faster to coordinated peristalsis. It's about uh, four days only with EPO versus 11 days. So there's something with this. Now, we're not suggesting we give erythropoietin to our obstructed kidneys uh, patients, but there's something in this pathway that we can use to exploit further therapies to help patients with obstructing kidney stones. So really there's a lot going on in the stent world in terms of coatings and new materials, new designs. We're working on the degradable stent and, and understanding what really is the scientific cause of all of these symptoms. Uh, again, I really thank you for this invitation and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the talks today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ben. It's, it's always uh, enlightening, if I may use that word, when I listen to your lectures, and I'm sure everybody feels the same. Uh, our next speaker, um, Dr. Rishi Joshi, I think we've been used to his name from 2003, when he first introduced the USSQ questionnaire. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you over here, and we'd love you to please give us your talk on how, you, how you know, the adaptations of USSQ questionnaire stand today and its future, please. So essentially, we're looking at uh, ureteric stent symptoms questionnaire and the remit of this talk was its development and application, but I'll cover some of the other principles, which I think as a urologist who appraise the evidence should know how uh, this area applies to our routine practices, to the research that we undertake to the patient side of the story. So essentially, what is a PROM? It's a report on patient's health condition that has to come directly from the patient without anyone else's interpretation. This is essentially a survey of perceived health problems and health services. What it does, it basically measures subjective quality of life in an objective fashion. And that quantifies it in a valid and reproducible way which are the criteria that should be satisfied for PROM. And it has got a lot of application, the traditional application being the randomized controlled trials and other evaluative studies. It's also being looked at how it can be used in routine monitoring of the quality of health, medical audits, social care, and the application keeps on going further in terms of uh, the area that we are looking at. 
it also looks at a common measure of gains from any technology. And it also undertakes economic evaluation to support decision making. So it has got a variety of applications. This is a little bit of a tongue twister. The area of quality of life measurement, and it's as uh, suggested by John Tucky. The principle is that it is often much worse to have good measurement of the wrong or inappropriate thing than to have poor measurement of the right thing, especially when the wrong thing will in fact be used as an indicator of the right thing. And the reason I quote this is that initially it was thought that quality of life assessment is a very woolly area, especially from clinician perspective. As a urologist, I know what's best. <clears throat> So was there any science behind it? And does it measure what we are supposed to measure? And there is a lot of science behind this. There's a lot of mathematics behind this. There is a lot of uh, measurement, psychometric science that is behind this to make it very evidence-based. So there is an established methodology while you develop a trauma. And it has evolved again in the last 15 years since the work on the USSK. So there is the initial stage of qualitative research where there's a literature review, patient and care of interviews, focal, focus groups, participation from other stakeholders such as nursing teams, maybe manufacturers, patient support groups, which essentially results in a data that undergoes computer aided thematic analysis and double coding, which essentially then results in a preliminary draft of an outcome major, which is self-reported question and by and large, which has got multiple scales or domains with various items. The key is that all stages, it has to be patient-centered. And then it undergoes the psychometric evaluation, which is nowadays categorized into traditional psychometric uh, evaluation, which is based on the field testing and looks at the validity of the new major reliability responsiveness and its interpretation. But there is now further development in this field with use of item response theory, uh, which is based on the mathematical principles of how you assess this in a scientific way and uses the rash measurement theory, which is a commonly applied theory behind this. And once it goes through all these phases, then you come off a final draft of a disease or intervention specific measure that can be then used for clinical applications. So this was the work that was published that explains the development of uh, the ureteric stent symptom questionnaire and the results from its validation. It involved essentially at that stage, 309 patients in different phases, as I explained. And in the phase three, where the field testing was carried out, it was found to be internally consistent with good test, retest reliability, sensitivity to change, and ability to discriminate patients with, without stents, healthy patients, patients with urinary stones, without and with stents. So at that stage, this was the first time we could document the impact of ureteric stents on patients' quality of life, which suggested that, that almost 80% of patients will have bothersome urinary symptoms. Similar number of patients will have strength-related pain. A proportion of patients will have sexual dysfunction with significant impact on their work capacity with negative economic impact. And this resulted in coining of a term for stent experience which couldn't be explained by any other terminology. So if you have a major, how it's applied to the clinical practice and how it dictates the evaluation, but also the evolution of the, the new technology. And what it does is that it results in some data that gives in, uh, such as observational studies that tells you the trends that we observe in clinical practice. It also guides the engineering techniques that were used to evaluate stents, the pharmacological principles used to address the stent related problems and influence the practice patterns. What could be the alternatives, how we can educate the patient, how we can counsel the patient better and combine approach to address the problem of stent related problems. 
So I'm going to just give some examples of how the UHST was used or how uh, outcome measure could be used to address these issues. <clears throat> so this was one paper where uh, uh, it was looked to see whether there are any predictive factors that could tell us who are the patients who are likely to have problems. And again, it was looking at the outcomes at day seven and day 20, looking at the uh, scores on the USSQ. And we looked at sex, body mass index, stent caliber, very significantly associated with one domain each, such as general health or body pain or work performance. Four, location of stent and its distal loop, again, having influence on significant domains of functioning. And similarly, there was pattern that emerged from uh, the correlation with USSQ at day 28. Now the STEM practices as to how much, uh, how longer it stays in uh, varies across uh, continents. And it are, that is something that is influenced by not just, not just the patient factors or the operating factors, but also what is available, what is feasible in a given healthcare system. And it's again, multidimensional thing. This was a, uh, uh, this is slide shows a combination of studies that looks at physical uh, factors related to the stent and their influence on the uh, patient's quality of life using urethric stent symptoms questionnaire as an outcome measure. It's quite a busy slide. I won't go into the details, but essentially the take home message was that we haven't designed a perfect stent by changing its design a little bit changing its diameter, changing its length, changing its composition, that could influence patient's quality of life substantially. Because one thing I used to see is that in different conferences or even hospitals, you would meet a lot of uh, stent company representatives coming up with new product and putting on their brochure, their stent has got best patient comfort. And I used to ask, what's the data for this? And how would you explain this? and there wasn't much science behind that. So things have evolved, and again, an outcome measure can give you the uh, right kind of tool to measure this. So there wasn't anything, of course, um, Ben's work uh, or data um, from the previous slide has shown that there are some studies which show uh, that there are some benefits to be gained from using a less diameter stent. Other studies have shown that it can change the length and might have benefit, again, a larger data coming on this using uh, validated tools will help to ratify those findings from single uh, RCTs. Then came the whole area of use of pharmacotherapy in uh, addressing the stent related problem and people tried uh, local injection of drugs but also the systemic therapy and this has shown a lot more promise. So there was uh, quite a few studies, RCTs that use ureteric stent symptom questionnaire and looked at the effect of systemic therapies and further this resulted into multiple meta-analysis looking at the impact of different medications, essentially the alpha blockers, anti or combination of this and other medications such as Tetrolac or painkillers to address this problem. What it essentially showed that uh, there was a fair amount of gain by use of uh, alpha blockers. If you add, give alpha blockers to patients who have stent related symptoms, then there is substantial improvement in a proportion of patients. Similarly, there was some gain seen with alpha, uh, with anticholinergics and use of uh, USSQ facilitated to look at the impact of individual domains of patient functioning in terms of urinary symptoms, body pain, general health, and see what were the benefits out of this. And there were significant benefits to be noted. <clears throat> so these were the impact on uh, different domains, indicating that by and large, there is uh, improvement in patient symptoms in terms of urinary symptoms or body pain with variable impact on sexual matters or general health domain. Clearly, this is the field that needs to further uh, evolve, uh, but has shown promise. And I think uh, if 
we have treated patients with these medications. As a clinician, we have also seen that there is a proportion of patients who will show improvement. You can tie their, uh, tie their problems with the stent, with the use of these medications. So again, the use of an outcome measure can validate your clinical suspicion, your clinical trials with findings such as this. And of course, there are additional applications. So in terms of the USSQ, it has undergone linguistic and cross-cultural validation in over 18 languages with worldwide applications. So it's undergone Spanish, German, Italian, Hindi, Korean, Chinese, Russian, all those uh, languages now the USSQ is available. But what it's allowed is for the local studies to take place, creation of and dissemination of local evidence base uh, that would help the patient communication with within their uh, sort of geographical areas. It allowed the local researchers and other stakeholders to be part of the stent research, including manufacturers or paramedical staff, because a lot of the stent studies have been related to the major stent manufacturers. However, there are local stent manufacturers in different countries, and now they can take part uh, in this research to show how their stem stands in, in the local geographical areas. Also, it stays as a valid tool for the clinical trials to evaluate any of the new stem designs. Again, Ben has mentioned a lot of uh, potential for different stem designs to be uh, coming out into the clinical realms. And again, tools like this will allow to validate the findings from the initial uh, studies based on these new stem designs. Of course, there is always a scope for more work so there have been attempts to look at the electronic formats of administration of USSQ, re-evaluation of the USSQ using modern theories such as rash measurement theories, and uh, further wider application in terms of patient communication, defining patient communication tools, uretic stent, uh, information leaflets to better communicate all this, such as the that, that the USSQ and the work coming out of it helped us to uh, have a framework for patient communication by designing a uh, patient information leaflet on uretric stents. So this is the application of the USSQ in the clinical practice, but I think the principle of designing uh, outcome measure, the science behind it, how it can be applied to clinical practice in any field will be of use to all of us as the urologists, as clinicians, but also the researchers within us. And I think we need to know the sound principles behind it to work out what research is telling, whether it is valid enough, whether the data coming out is scientifically strong or not based on the outcome studies. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Joshi. That was a very stimulating lecture. I think the proof in the pudding is the fact that 2003, you. You invented something like this, and nothing in stents can progress even 15 years later or 20 years later where we stand without referring to the USSQ as its baseline. And I think that that itself is uh, is uh, adieu, adieu to the amount of hard work that must have gone in then. So thank you so much. And, um, you know, stenting is something which is constantly evolving, and our next speaker, Dr. Nikita, will take us through the current trends in stenting. So, Dr. Nikita... Uh, we welcome you. Please present your topic. Um, thank you, first of all, for inviting me to talk here. Um, as I was introduced, I am a registrar in the UK, uh, but I'm also a member of the BURS, which is the British Urology Researchers and Surgical Training. And a lot of whatever I'm going to present today is a team effort. So it's uh, not only me. Um, so I think stents are essentially something that we as urology registrars go through um, every single day when you're consenting patients and you tell them that you need a stent. Um, I find that conversation uh, quite hard because you end up telling them that they will be uncomfortable, they'll cause you pain, they'll have you have blood in the urine and all sorts of other things, uh, but you still need it. Uh, and I sometimes tell them it's almost a necessary evil. And that's because if I don't leave it in, you might come into the hospital with pain and you might have to have another procedure um, to get a further stent in. Um, but is this really true? Are we really practicing evidence-based medicine when we say something like this? Or is this defensive medicine that allows us to sleep at night? 
So what do we know from the evidence? Well, the NICE guidelines and the European Association of Urology clearly st states that uh, clinicians should not leave stents after uncomplicated urea droscopies. After this, there were a couple of um, surveys that were conducted that showed that actually, despite clear evidence of not stenting, there's a high tendency of temporary ureteric stenting, even after an uncomplicated ureteroscopy. And I'm sure we all see this in our daily practice. So Cochrane decided to do a systematic review and a meta-analysis on this last year. And what they said was that the desirable and undesirable effects of stents are small in absolute numbers. The limitations uh, in the current studies mean that we need higher quality, sufficiently large trials um, to answer this important question to better inform decision making. So either way, they cannot say anything about whether stenting is good or bad. So I just want to go into what is an uncomplicated ureteroscopy because we use this term quite a lot in our practice. So I'm going to go through the guidelines. The EAU guideline essentially says that an uncomplicated ureteroscopy um, in, includes anything um, that does not have a ureteral trauma, residual fragments, uh, bleeding, perforation, previous infections, or pregnancy. But then it goes on to say that if you're in doubt to avoid a stressful emergency, stent the patient. Um, if you go to the NICE guidelines, they uh, had a really bold statement last year when they said that if um, anyone who has a stone less than two centimeters, do not stent them. But then they have said that you can't consider stenting in these situations if you are anticipating more treatment, there's an evidence of either an infection or obstruction, or they have a solitary kidney. And then finally, if you go across the Atlantic, the Americans say that if you, um, you consider an uncomplicated ureteroscopy as something that meets all of these criteria. So there's no suspected injury, there's no stricture, the contralateral kidney is normal, the renal function is normal, and you're not planning another procedure. If you look at the evidence grades or levels, there's either an evidence grade A or the level of evidence is quite high. So I went into the literature myself to try and understand what was going on and why is there so much conflicting evidence and conflicting practice. What I found was, if you look at system, there have been a lot of randomized control trials and systematic reviews on this topic of stenting versus no stenting, but the evidence out there is completely conflicted. And I'll go through why. Um, in 2007 and 2011, uh, two authors, uh, Nabi and Pengfi, essentially went through whether you should stent patients or not. And their inclusion criteria were very clear. They said we'll only include uncomplicated ureteroscopy. And as per EAU guidelines, if they have a complicated ureteroscopy, they were excluded. What they found based on their systematic review of nine and then 16 RCTs was there was no difference in analgesia, infection, stent free rate, uh, stone free rate, sorry, or a stricture rate. Um, in fact, uh, there's a lower likelihood of unplanned medical visits um, with stents, but this is not significant. Um, the cost favored the unstented group, as you would imagine. So essentially, they said there is no difference. But then there's two systematic reviews in 2016 and 2017 that kind of muddied the waters. And this is because uh, what they did uh, in 2016, uh, out of the 17 RCTs and observational studies, they included all ureteroscopy. So they included the complicated and the uncomplicated ones. And then another study, 2017, uh, also did this. And they went on to also include ESWL, not only ureteroscopy. And they ended up saying that actually, if you stent your patients, then there's a higher, there's a lower chance that they'll come back into the emergency department. So if you've unstented patients, they tend to come back into the hospital more often. But as you can see, that their inclusion criteria is not as definitive as the previous two uh, systematic reviews. Um, and then I think as uh, Dr. Chu has already gone through this, there is not a lot of evidence on how long you should be leaving stents for. I could only find two uh, studies. One was an RCT, which Dr. Chu has already gone through. Um, sorry. And the other one um, is um, a retrospective cohort study where they divided their patients uh, based on uh, 14 days and 15 days. And they found that anything over 15 days has a significant higher ratio of fever or other adverse events. So they recommended less than 14 days. So it might seem that seven to 14 days is the golden period. Um, but if you look at all these trials, what you can clearly see as it's they're looking at things like readmission rate, LUTs, flying, etc. But they are missing uh, 
something that's really important for stent patients. And we've gone through this quite nicely in the previous talk. Um, it's about patient reported measures. And this is really important because a stent, you might put it in for a week or two, but this affects the patient's life dramatically. And every time I tell the patient I put in a stent, and if they've had a stent before, this is the kind of conversation I end up having. Um, it's painful, I can't drive, I can't work, it's, um, I bleed, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really affecting their quality of life. So why is there not an RCT comparing stenting versus no stenting, looking at specific patient reported outcome measures? Um, and in this case, obviously, we have to use something that also covers our unstented patient. And there are things like that. Uh, something from Cambridge is called the CUSP tool um, that looks at that. And Dr. Chu has been involved with the Wisconsin tool that also looks at something like this. Um, so that's something that we really need to look at. So what did we think? We thought we need to conduct, clear there's evidence, there is a need to conduct an RCT, um, whether stenting is superior to not stenting in uncomplicated ureteroscopies. But you also want to try and understand what are the current views and practice around the world for ureteric stenting after uncomplicated ureteroscopies only. So we essentially disseminated an international online survey-based um, feasibility study through all these um, different associations. We are very grateful to them uh, for disseminating our study. It was a mixed methods model and we use REDCAP for this. So we defined our index patient very clearly as someone who's had a definitive routine urethrovenoscopy uh, for either uh, ureteric or renal stones. And after this, either you decide whether you wanna put a stent in or not. Uh, but the definitions are quite clear. So a definitive urethroscopy means the final uh, urethroscopy for stone when you've completed all the treatments and there's no further treatment required. And uncomplicated, we decided to define according to the EAU guidelines because this is the most thorough definition that we have at the moment. So what, we were very grateful that we had around 468 respondents. Um, a majority were from the UK, but we are a UK-based um, collaborative. Um, a lot of them, 70% almost, were consultants, um, but we have good representation from around the world. So essentially what we said was, we found first of all that our respondents are high volume stone surgeons. So I, I can draw your attention to the first graph on the left where almost 75% of our respondents perform at least more than five ureteroscopies a day. Then if you look at the graph uh, on the right side, you will see that almost half of them almost always stent their patients after ureteroscopies. Only 8% will never stent their patients. And these are uncomplicated ureteroscopies. We then asked them, how often did you leave a stent in in the previous month um, after an uncomplicated ureteroscopy? Well, 92% said that, yes, I left one in. And then we asked, what if it was you or your family member who had had this procedure? And that number dropped down to 70%. So 22% said, well, actually, if it was me, I'll not have a stent in. Um, and then we asked them, how long do you leave these in? So uh, according to the uh, studies that we have, uh, this was corresponding to that almost 62% said less than two weeks, but I can draw your attention to the 6% who leave it in for over a month. In a procedure where this is almost possibly not required, to have a stent in for over a month is not great for the patient. So then we asked them, why do you leave a stent in after an uncomplicated ureteroscopy? And these answers, I'm, not, I'm pretty sure that no one is surprised by them. Um, ureteric edema, small fragments. Uh, I don't want them to come back to the hospital. I'm trying to follow what I was taught before, and I don't want them to have obstruction from clots, et cetera, et cetera. We then asked them, what are the criteria that you are using to decide whether you want to stent them or not? And the complexity of the case was the most important one, as in an impacted stone the length of the procedure, the size or the nature of the stone, which is something that is not included in the definition of a complicated or an uncomplicated ureteroscopy at the moment. And that is, this is quite significant. So then we decided to do uh, specific scenarios. So we, if you look at this graph, the blue is no stent, the orange is ureteric catheter, the gray is a stent on a string, and the yellow is a double J stent requiring a cystoscopic removal. If you go from a top to bottom, I've arranged this in ascending order of when clinicians are more likely to stent. And as you can see, as your uh, situation gets more complicated from a pre-stented ureter to a rigid ureteroscopy alone, operating time of less than 40 
five minutes, you're more likely to not put a stent in. But then if you come to the bottom of this graph, if they've had operation of more than 90 minutes, access sheath, impacted stone, they are more likely to have a stent. So why are these things not included in the definition of what is a complicated ureteroscopy? So finally, we asked our respondents, if we were to conduct a trial that looks at patient reported outcome measures as our primary outcome with a 30 day readmission rate after ureteroscopy, uncomplicated ureteroscopy, would you be willing to participate? And this is just to gauge their engagement. And we were very happy to see that 81% said that they would randomize their patients. However, 91% were more willing to randomize them into the stented arm as compared to 85% in the unstented arm. So even in a randomized control trial, people are a bit hesitant to randomize in an unstented arm. So I want to talk to you through why should we do an RCT? Because a lot of you might think, well, there is evidence out there already. Why are we talking about this? Um, well, there's something very similar in stones called the MET. I'm sure everyone has heard about this and has been discussed at a lot of meetings. It is similar to um, stenting. I'll talk you through why. Well, it, there's a small group of patients that all of us think that MET might be useful in, and there are the larger distal stones. We don't know exactly how it works. And Cochrane in 2014 um, had a similar systematic review of limited methodological strength of the RCTs. And they said, well, a bigger trial might be useful. So this is the trial that came out of the UK after this Cochrane review only a year later, which is the suspend, which essentially said that MET is not useful. Um, and what are the side effects? Why are we discussing this? Well, the cost, then there's side effects of alpha blockers. Now I'll take you through stents. And we, again, there's a group of us who think, well, they may not be necessary in uncomplicated ureteroscopy. No one really knows why we put them in. Cochrane has already put a meta-analysis similar to the one from MET. And the side effects, I would argue, are much more significant. The cost is more, and it affects the patient's quality of life significantly. So in conclusion, what I want to say is that stents um, cause severe morbidity, cost, and effect on quality of life. It might be a short period of time for us, but it's a, it has a big impact on the patient's life and something that we really need to consider. The current evidence, as I've talked you through it, has definitely got limitations. The single most important factor, that's the patient reported outcome measures, have not been looked at properly. Current practice is still favoring stenting, even in our survey that was done only last year. There are several criteria that we have identified to stent in practice that are not covered by the guidelines at all. So what we need to try and now do is redefine an uncomplicated ureteroscopy because it's much more than what the guidelines say. And there is equipoise to participate in such an RCT. So we are in the process of designing one and I would urge you all to please participate in it if you're interested. Um, thank you very much and thank you for the invitation. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Nikita. That was uh, beautifully presented, very clear. Uh, you know, you outlined the controversies that we are facing day to day even now, I must confess, in my two decades of practice, I've been, like you rightfully said, stenting just for the peace of mind, falsely maybe. But uh, COVID again has totally opened up a new dimension towards this. And uh, it also has changed my practice in stenting. And I'm sure as we proceed with the rest of the speakers, we'll get a little more insights about uh, uncomplicated ureteroscopy. But I think the first thing that comes up is a challenge when you have infections. So Dr. Arvind, we are very much looking forward to your talk about PCN versus stenting in infections of the kidney. Dr. Arvind, all yours, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Vinit. Uh, I must put on record my sincere thanks to my dear friend, Dr. Zishan, and of course, uh, Dr. Bhaskar for giving me this opportunity, and of course, I too. Uh, I'm, I've been charged with the responsibility of talking something about in renal infections, what do we exactly do? Uh, is double J stenting preferable or is percutaneous nephrostomy preferable? The flow of my talk would be somewhat like this. I'll be first uh, setting the ball rolling by discussing a few index cases, highlighting a very few important uh, papers in the literature. Uh, literature is different from what we face practically, so I'll be discussing few practical points, a case where everything went horribly long, wrong, and finally I'll propose an algorithm. So going straight away to the index case one, this was a four-year-old female. She had presented with a right flank pain since past 10 days. 
with on and off fever uh, for the past seven days. And on evaluation, we found something like this and uh, uh, thinned out cortex with a moderate hydronephrosis. And as you can see, there is a lot of debris in the lower calyx. Her counts as expected were 17,000. Uh, we didn't diuretic, actually she came with this diuretic renogram and her split function was 17%. So, uh, as expected, we decided to go ahead with an uh, percutaneous nephrostomy and ultrasound guided percutaneous nephrostomy was done. Uh, uh, as, as we were doing the, uh, the, uh, uh, the procedure, we realized that actually the patient had got a very thick pus, as you can see shortly as the video progresses, that uh, on the initial puncture, uh, the first uh, urine that came out was uh, a turbid urine. However, uh, later on, as you can see, it was a thick pus. So why do I show this case here? Because obviously the PCN has got an advantage of optimal drainage of bionephrosis. In addition, in this particular situation, we have uh, we get an additional advantage of an ability to assess the split function. And of course, there are no stent related symptoms in such a small child. The second case, uh, I wanted to uh, bring out a few points in this case, a 65 years old male with a right flank pain, uh, having a LUTS, came with raised creatinine with fever, nausea, vomiting. Uh, the UAG was suggesting uh, the same as we can see here uh, in the in the CT picture that you can see that the right side hydronephrosis is there, but on the left side you can see that the ureter is absolutely unhealthy. You can see that actually that is the cause for the stone on the left hand side. So on the right hand side there was absolutely no uh, doubt in our mind that uh, a stent will easily go in because the hydronephrosis was not significant. The ureter was seen throughout its course, but as expected on the left hand side you you see that it's a bit difficult to even pass and terimo glide wire beyond the stone and a little bit manipulation uh, uh, extracorporeally as, as well as by the endovirologist and the wire went in. But that was not same for the stent as well. And we, we were a little bit worried here that whether the stent is going to train appropriately or the creatine is going to come, come down after this stenting. As you can see here, the stenting was a bit difficult, uh, but ultimately we were able to pass across a 4.8 French stent. So the question that came to our mind was, was this case a case for double J stenting to begin with, given the difficulty, or a PCN would have been a better option? So coming to the talk, uh, I feel that uh, PCN versus DJ stenting actually is an unfair comparison. It's not about which is better. The moot point is when to opt for which one, when to opt for a double J stenting and when to opt for a percutaneous nephrostomy. We all are clinicians and we know that we take all these factors into account. Uh, whether it's an upper uterine obstruction, whether it's an lower uterine obstruction, the general condition of, of the patient, whether we can do it in supine or uh, prone, whether the patient is on anticoagulants, the severity of obstruction, degree of obstruction, the functional status of the kidney. The upsides of doing an uh, percutaneous nephrostomy is that it can be done under local anesthesia, even in critically ill patients, gross dilatation with pyonephrosis is the indication. The upside is that it doesn't have any LUTS, no dysuria, good quality of life, left chance of blockage, even with a large bore PCN. In addition, we'll be able to quantify the split renal function, useful for long-term diversion. However, in double J stenting, uh, the obvious advantages are that it is less invasive, easy acceptability in no external tubes, and possible whenever there is mild or sometimes moderate hydronephrosis. Downsides are there for both. Uh, percutaneous nephrostomy obviously requires a little bit more care. The patient acceptability is less, contraindicated in patients who are on anticoagulants. Uh, the downsides of stent, again, stent-related dysuria, uh, the quality of life is poor, the stents get blocked with thick pus. Uh, sometimes the short general anesthesia is also required, sometimes difficult in critically ill patients. Uh, those requiring lithotomy, sometimes it might be difficult. So the jury is still out. What does the literature talk about it? Uh, we, uh, I'll discuss on these three points. Is PCN better than DJ stenting? What does the literature say? Uh, does the etiology dictate the modality of diversion? Are there any specific indi indications for the use of either? Uh, so this paper, uh, which has come from uh, from the uh, from Pakistan, uh, says that percutaneous nephrostomy is definitely better than double J stenting. But little uh, going a little bit further, and which is a little bit recent paper. Uh, this paper says that uh, the two techniques have got their own distinct advantages. However, over the time, PCN patients, the symptom relief and their QL improves, while double J stenting patients, the symptoms persist. So this particular thing has to be taken into account, particularly when you have to maintain the diversion for some uh, for a long period of time. What about special situations? What does the literature say? Particularly in emphysematous pyelonephritis, 
as this special uh, paper uh, as as this article quotes that it uh, the double j stenting is the preferred mode particularly with proper antibiotics and adequate glycemic control particularly in children what should be the modality so uh, this has come from egypt they recommend that uh, percutaneous nephrostomy tubes are preferred if the stone size is more than 3 uh, more than 2 cm particularly when you consider that such a severe obstruction the uh, stenting is not going to succeed and finally uh, uh, as far as the literature goes this one this paper which comes from uh, from india uh, they uh, give us the predictive risk factors for each of the diversions and they uh, recommend that in patients with sepsis from obstructive urolithiasis due to large and multiple calculi pcn is the preferred modality of diversion so just to summarize uh, the qol uh, as far as the qol is concerned pcn uh, it goes in favor of the pcn as far as the cause of obstruction and infection are concerned if it is an uh, if it is a mild obstruction say a lower urethral stone double j stenting would be preferable however a large stone definitely a percutaneous nephrostomy is the choice if the stones are multiple obviously an percutaneous nephrostomy would be the treatment of choice and the most important thing is age and comorbidity we have to have a look whether a supine pcn is possible the literature says all these things however there are a few practical points which we have to also consider when we are considering this particular issue we have to consider what is the degree of hydronephrosis the general condition of the patient and most important the expertise available and the preference of the patient and the physician so take take this case you can see that it almost no hydronephrosis almost it's impossible to access percutaneous uh, uh, percutaneously the kidney uh, for a noise so obviously in such a situation and double j stenting would be preferable mild hydronephrosis it is challenging to gain access however it's possible so again pcn or uh, dj stenting it depends on many other factors and uh, for this case as you can see moderate to gross hydronephrosis so and percutaneous access would be easy take this uh, this particular situation wherein the hydronephrosis is mild and we have got a patient who is diabetic who is obese have, having multiple comorbidities we have to assess whether we will be able to gain access to the uh, kidney particularly with no hydronephrosis so which thing we will prefer whether we will do an percutaneous nephrostomy or a double j stenting so it depends on all these factors in such a situation the comorbidities the age the anticoagulants uh, the severity of sepsis and uh, all these things taken together so be before we sum up let's see how an error of judgment in selecting the modality of diversion could be devastating so this was a patient who was an who was an 68 years old male having no comorbidities he presented to us in uh, he presented to his doctor in 2020 with left flank pain uh, he was treated conservatively at that time but the pain persisted so just a month ago he presented with left flank pain uh, to the to the original physician as you can see there was a stone and opposite side kidney you can see that it's an uh, grossly heteronephrotic system and you cannot see the ureter on the uh, on the ultrasound so we underwent a left pcnl with a bilateral dj stenting however after 20 days the both the uh, both the double j stents were removed following this he had got a severe episode and bout of sepsis and he presented to us with an right dj stent in c2 reduced appetite and severe upper abdominal pain his counts were 12500 and an initial x ray shows this particular point that you can see that the, from the lie of the double j stent you can see that the stent is not in position you can see that the stent appears to be knotted definitely uh, it's anybody's guess that the dj stent is not correctly positioned a ct iu further revealed that there is a misplaced knotted stent you can see that there is a perinephric collection obviously because the kidney is not draining and there is a perinephric collection and in addition you can see internal lipos so uh, we decided to do an percutaneous nephrostomy here so uh, as you can see here uh, initially also you can see that there is a lot of debris here so to begin with uh, a stenting was not a good option or a preferred option you can see a little bit dilated ureter and throughout the ultrasound scan you you can uh, you will agree with me that the stent was not seen which was also confirmed initially on our uh, ct image so uh, i would like to put forth the learning points which we learned from these three cases that what went wrong and the, what were the lesson learned from here that particularly whenever the hydronephrosis is severe the degree of hydronephrosis itself indicates that percutaneous nephrostomy should be the diversion of choice and it should be done up front as you can see here particularly when the stenting is difficult in such situations double j stent not be the pre preferred modality of diversion and in this case as you can make out even while stenting the lie of the digestant gives an indication that it is in an undesirable position 
so uh, before i sign off uh, the patient factors which one should consider before uh, before deciding whether an percutaneous nephrostomy is desirable or a double j stent is desirable of course the general condition of the patient whether the patient is on anticoagulants the location of obstruction the degree of obstruction and of course uh, as far as the disease factors go we have to decide whether it's a benign or a malignant uh, obstruction leading to sepsis uh, and what what would be the duration of diversion uh, uh, diversion that is required so we suggest the following algorithm suppose the patient presents with renal infections with obstructive uropathy if the patient is vitally stable he is a little bit high risk for anesthesia having an upper ureteric obstruction large multiple stones moderate to gross hydronephrosis particularly if the obstruction is malignant long term diversion is required there is a suspicion of pyonephrosis then the modality of diversion should be percutaneous nephrostomy on the other hand if you feel that the patient is vitally stable the patient is not on anticoagulants there is a uh, obstruction which is lower down in the ureter small calculi and if the if if uh, in the discretion of the surgeon he feels that the kidney is not puncturable mild hydronephrosis benign etiology then definitely the modality of obstruction should be double j stenting so i leave you with this particular algorithm which clear cut indicates and uh, lets us uh, know which should be the preferred modality of diversion again i would like to thank i do vinith uh, bhaskar Uh, as well as uh, Zishan for this particular opportunity. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Arvind. That was really nice. You've you've uh, left some very clear cut uh, viewpoints, which I think a definite take home message is, which is a great algorithm as well. It's always been my thinking that, uh, or rather, learning. We've always learned that whenever there's infection lower down, you divert proximally. So it was just this understanding that put a PCN and and you'll probably sleep well. But often we've seen that we put in a stent. and that can equally act well but uh, some of the points that you highlighted are so relevant and pertinent to to management uh, the next speaker we we move our focus from infections to strictures and with endourology uh, gaining momentum day to day worldwide i think everybody is waiting for you dr saeed to give us an insight as to how do you manage these strictures with stenting Thank you much, Vinit. It's my pleasure to be among these uh, renowned yeah. names. I have to declare that I work with these certain companies. And uh, first of all, you asked me to talk about endoscopic measures for the stenting post uh, endoscopic treatment of ureteric structure. But if we want to understand the the endoscopic measures of the structures, we have to and. we have to think and comprehend about the causes the prevention the treatment option the stenting the material and the period and what are the sizes and of course we have to talk about the anatomy we have to know that the lower ureter is a slight um the lower uh, the uh, uh, size is a 3 to 5 french the mid ureter is a 5 french the upper ureter is 10 french and this will lead us to the not only the anatomical thing it's all lead us to the physiological and what is the nature of that tube as the length the diameter the angle where it is got in the bladder so in the beginning 35 years ago carter he just published something about 4% of the structure then in 2014 this famous a study from the group of the endurological society where they published about 11 ureteroscopy when they mentioned that the structure became from 4% to 0.5% structures so the structure is 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 not problem why because we have a new generation of endoscopes we have a new accessories with a huge improvements we have a smaller instruments and of course we are having a training and experience for our residents and for our doctors if you look for these structures by nature as in discopic uh, manner that most of them they have the uh, 60% of them related to the stone and ureteroscopy and this is a very important to understand why we have to know Uh, we have to deal with this is it the thermal injury of the uh, of the laser or other um, manners of later surgery manners or mechanical injuries is it the embedded fragments is it the perforation is it the impacted stone by itself 
So we have to understand why we have these structures. In the scopes 15 years ago, 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we're at 12th fringe. Let's go to see these um, semi-rigid, big semi-rigids. We are talking about 12th when they started by the Spanish um, uh, group. Well, this is a very real problem for people. They did not notice, notice it because they want to get rid of the stone. But with the visual improvement of these scopes came to have these thinkings because we are not following the patients. We are just removing the stones and we are telling the patients, your stone is in your hand. Go away and we don't know yet what's the future of these stones. So let's go for the lithotripsy manners. Electric pneumatic laser. Laser came because it's less, less retropulsive, fascinating technique, and it came to help you to achieve more with a better outcome. Let me take you to this patient. We had, he had a urethoscopy with the electric a pneumatic six weeks ago, where these stone with their huge retropulsive effects embedded into the outer side mm -hmm. of the ureter. And eventually you could see how much damage happened to that ureter with the cause of the pneumatic lithotropsy effects. So I'm not the guy that will telling you that go for laser. I know the whole world is that does not tolerate the laser cost effective, but we have to think about doing that in the correct way. What about the laser? Laser came here to help you because, you know, if you have a laser, you go from center to surface, not the head, the wall. And you have to go with low energy to achieve more outcome and not to insult more the ureter as you can see here, you could see here in the, in the three slide, in the three videos in your right hand. What about the thermal effects of the ureter? Do not hesitate to leave a stent if you're using a laser and you are having a doubt of, of a thermal effects into your ureter because it might help you later on with six weeks, four weeks, it's up to you when you see these effects. So laser is not as safe as well, but if you see these injuries, you have to think about a stinking patient because I think most of the urologists came out with thinking, okay, stainless ureteroscopy. So what is the definition of the simple ureteroscopy? What is the definition of laser lithotripsy? Did you hit the wall? Did you hit the, lay, the stone itself? Did you hit from the, the stone from the surface? What about the guide wire? Guide wire co could cause these strictures, as you could see here in the left side, completely out of the impacted stone. Or you could put the, the, the guide wire in out, as you see in the middle video here. Or you could just do a simple perforation. We don't know yet what is the future nature of these injuries. What about the perforation? That's why we have to do a proper retrograde urethropyography because the prevention is more important than the treatment. So we cannot underestimate the guide wire. This is a very simple nitinol guide wire. It could give you a huge extravasation and might be a structure in the future. What, the, what about the active dilatation? Everybody's talking about the balloon is for birthdays. Look at this. This is, I have done it myself. This is a 15 French balloon. I want to get in that ureter, very small, almost a three French. I have dilated to 15 French. Imagine that you are yourself that you have done, put a small size a t-shirt in your size, which is an X large t-shirt. So you will just crack it down and you will end up with a very ugly ureter. So the balloon and active dilatation has no rule in the ureter. We go we have to move on to the passive dilatation, put a double G stent and wait for the patient. What about the basket? 
I have to tell you that you have to look to the right side, that video, when the surgeon neurologist pull that stone, look at it in the right side, please look at it. Stretching. So because he is pulling the ureter inside the ureteral axis sheath. You have, you can see it, right? So these are, these are the, the kind of impatient of urologists and endurologists. You have to be patient to achieve something, an outcome. If you pull that stone out of the, of the ureter and you end up off something that I have seen myself, what you call it ureteric intersusception, and you end up of reconstruction of the whole ureter because you pulled out of that stone and evaginate the ureter inside the ureter itself. Let's go to the basket itself. If you forget the basket, these are cases that I have faced that the basket lifts in the ureter wall. Oh. So how could you explain that the stricture could not come without prevention that you cannot leave a basket or a foreign body inside the wall of the ureter. Ureter is a very fine uh, tube. You have to be very delicate and very soft surgeon with it. Otherwise, it will punish you with a very reconstructive surgery. What is recently uh, accused by Olivia Traxler in 2013, which I have worked on it, that the access sheet came into the market and everybody is talking about the access sheet. And Olivier was telling me that 50% of the cases, 46%, they have a grade one. But if you look at the truth, what about the access sheet? It's only 3% have a very, uh, uh, very devastating injury. But most of these injuries are very superficial. Why we have discovered these cases? Because we have improvement in the vision. We have the stores, the Flix 6 c 2010. We have the Flix 6 2 since the 90s. We have even the disposable, which could show us the, the injuries, how much are we go into the bioutroscopy and see these injuries. And this gives us an idea about how we are injured, the ureter, for what? For just taking the stone of those patients out. So you could tell that most of the injuries comes into the distal ureter. Why? Because, because of two things. The anatomical, because it's in the right angle into the psoas. And the, the second thing is the size. We know the lower ureter is the smaller in size, the three to five French comparing to the upper ureter, which is 10 French. So most of the injuries and the strictures coming from the endoscopic treatment is from the distal ureter. And what else we could have from these endoscopic measures? Completely flab um, injury to the ureter, as you can see in the left side, or you have a stone in, beside, uh, behind the submucosal effect, or even you put the ureter away and you insert your guide wire or you access sheet in the retroperitoneal space. These could just, just create strictures for you and you will have uh, problems in the future. What, what is in the instant group just published something that in 12-14 French, the most important factor is the time and the size. If you could see in the left side that the 10 French 10-12 in the non-prepared ureter could be less devastating than the prepared ureter. So what is the from that uh, group uh, that the, you have to limit the time of using the access ureteral access sheet and to avoid the divorce if any persistent comes to you as you can see in the left side you should not push the actual access sheet against the force otherwise you'll have a problem just to send the patient and come back back again Preminger uh, from duke university he said in his publication in 2001, it's a mandatory to use an access sheet 
in every operation, which is something again is something uh, gold from the Michael Grasso, famous trainee of Bagley. When you see you can, you could use, uh, you could not, you could not use an access sheet. So it's a sheathless wireless. Even some people in pediatric group use a 1214. We haven't seen the devastating effects of the uteral access sheet. But the most problem here is to follow your patients because you're removing the stone and you say, okay, bye-bye. I give you the stone, see you later. And this is very wrong. And one thing again that we have to think about impacted stone because most of the literature say that the most common cause of uteroscopy complication and the structure formation is the impacted stone. We cannot blame the surgeon. We cannot blame these, uh, these instruments. We cannot blame these scopes because you leave the patient, you leave the patient for two months, three months, and you come and intervene uh, after three months. Eventually, he will have exchanges around the ureter. We call it periuretric changes, and this will create the ureteric stricture. And this is the eventually the pouch of the, as you could see, the pouch of the impacted stone by the OTU scope or the uh, flex XC scope or the bisami rigid. You can see these changes. Do you think these changes would come in as a smooth a follow up of the patients. We have to follow these patients. Otherwise, we don't know even the nature of these injuries, not because of the surgeon of the atroscopy, but because of the impacted zone. Even some studies, like the study of Godot, when he said that if you do a laser into uh, endurotrectomy, it will have a less successful rate by 56% comparing to 75% if you intervene early. So if you have an impacted stone, you have to tell your patient that the laser in ureterectomy could have uh, something um, less result and success rate rather than the rather than the impacted stone. So I'm not talking about reconstructive, I'm not talking about nephrectomy, I will talk about the endoscopic treatment, endopilotomy or laser enterectomy. I believe in these things, but we have we should not repeat it again. You have to do it once. If not, if not successfully, you have to do a very uh, a reconstructive surgery. You could see that if you have a structure in the upper ureter, you could do in the bellotomy, in the mid or lower, according to the vascular nature of the ureter, you do a laser into ureterectomy with the stenting. What is the stent that use post ureteric structure? This is a density. Um, 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 when he said that the silicon has been shown, showed that the silicon is, is the standard of your stents now because the compatibility and resistance of the structure. This is my patient. I put a polyurethane and a silicon uh, catheter, uh, sorry, a stent. Four weeks after the same patient, I put in the left side and the right side polyurethane and left on the right side and the silicone, you could see that the polyurethane could not save the shape and the design. It is mal designed and encrusted, while the silicone kept the shape in four weeks. So we have to think about the ureteric stents post endoscopic treatment that you put a structure just to the, just to reduce the complication, not only just to delay the start structure, to reduce the complication of incrustation, uh, incrustation or obstruction or uh, uh, migration. Even some companies, they just created for you a stenous stent, which is then the middle 12 French, because they think that the large caliber, I will show you in the next slide, the large caliber might help you after the endoscopic treatment to help you to dilate more and to have the most successful of the treatment. Some companies give you the pilo stint with some portion in the upper part of the stint, only 12 French, the rest is eight French. Why? Because if you do the pilo uh, ureteral junction structure or the upper ureter, you, you can put that stent because they believe in this thing where they, so they, they just publish it in the urology in the north, uh, uh, I believe it's in, 
in this group when he said that there is some evidence of large stent 12 of French plates for two to three weeks. So we have to think about the large caliber and the more two to three weeks to, for better long-term success of the of these kind of the structure. So what about the uh, the these stents, um, Mimucat, Uvinta, Resonance, Allium? I I personally I don't think this is a good option for benign urethral stricture. I think this is a for malignant strictures. But if you have a patient which is a uh, which he is not um, suitable for reconstruction or for more uh, options, you could have these uh, choices. You could see most of the publication were thinking about malignant esthetic structure. It's not about your structure. Why? Because we have these problems, migration, encrustation, encrustation obstruction. You cannot leave a stent for a one year and you think your patient will come easily and you change that stent easily. I have done some cases I have face encrustation. I have big problem with putting them and reinsertion them. So the take home messages from these, uh, from these um, uh, strictures that you have to intervene early to prevent them and you have to limit your operative time. If it doesn't allow you, do not force. And if you have a problem, terminate it and put a double G stent and come again and go smaller with your instruments. Go smaller with your semi-rigid. Go smaller with your urethral access sheet. Go smaller with everything you could have. Explore your ureter perseveratively because it could be an idea about how long you're gonna keep your double G stent and do not hesitate to put a stent perseveratively because this is a problem with most urologists that they are bragging that not to put a double G stent perseveratively and this is a problem for young urologists. We have to teach them until they get the their experience and large stents, as you could see from the from these lectures, that it could help you. Twelve or fourteen, most of the most of the um, double G stent silicones or others, they have a twelve fringe, and metallic stents are option for you. But you have to think about incrustation or about the migration and other stuff. Thank you very much. Fantastic, fantastic, Dr. Said. You know, just watching you present this in such an animated way, and I mean physically animated with the videos that you showed, I'm sure the viewers agree with me that there was a lot of take home over here, a benign disease, but the stricture is not really a benign problem. It actually becomes quite a malignant problem to handle. But malignancy is a different ball game, and, and it's a wonderful pleasure for me to now invite Dr. Mario, and, uh, you know, most people know him as the thousand PCNL man. But Dr. Sofa, I've given you this topic because I know that, you know, you'll be the best person to tell us on how do you handle malignant strictures, please. Good evening, good afternoon, and good day, everybody from Tel Aviv. It's just great to join this prestigious panel. And I'd like to express my gratitude to the organizer for inviting me. So this nasty guy cannot beat us. We just have to adopt the Zoom era apparel and go ahead. <laughs> New oncologic therapies prolong survival of patients with advanced malignant diseases, including those presenting with malignant ureteral obstruction. Data from the American Cancer Society show a progressive increase in five years relative cancer survival rates. For example, in the last five decades, the relative five-year colorectal cancer survival expanded from 48 to 69 years, uh, months. The lymphoma from 47 to 75 and the ovary uh, up to 12 months. This improvement in cancer-specific survival is significant when adjusted for stage as well. Malignant ureteral obstruction incidence is not well defined. However, it occurs in the advanced regional and metastatic stages, when as mentioned, patients may still reach significant longevity. We have to intervene in this frame time when patient may still have a significant survival. For example, again, colorectal between 14 and 17 months. 
ovary between 29 and 75 masses. As such, patients with malignant ureteral obstruction seek for long-term, durable, simple, and low-cost palliative solutions of the compression with minimal negative impact on quality of life. The obstruction can be related to direct uh, compression, extrinsic compression, invasion, and fibrosis secondary to repeated surgical interventions or radiation. To date, percutaneous nephrostomy, polymeric, and various metallic stents are used with variable success rates in obviating the obstruction. Percutaneous uh, nephrostomy tubes, one of the drainage possibilities, provide effective drainage, but their extracorporeal tubing and bags negatively affect patient mobility, quality of life, and self-esteem. They are also associated with frequent side effects and complications in long-term users and need to be routinely replaced every three months. My talk will focus on internalization of drainage by means of stenting that spares patients from extracorporeal devices, but expose some of them to flank pain and irritative complaints. Polymeric stents are probably still the most used in these situations. They are characterized by relative low cost and wide availability. The first use of an internal stent for treating malignant ureteral obstruction was reported by Zipskin, Fetter, and Wilkerson in 1967. They used silicone rubber tubes of 7.3 or 9.6 French inserted in seven patients. They describe the technique, which today sounds strange and fun, and I recommend you to you uh, to read it just for your fun. A patency of two to 12 months was achieved in these cases. In fact, the success rate of using polymeric single stents was very modest. This team from Pittsburgh University reported their experience with single polymeric stents 16 years ago. In a series of 90 stented units, almost half failed in a mean of 52.4 days. Pre-stenting creatinine higher than 1.3 and post-stenting need for further chemo or radiotherapy were prognosticators of failure in univariate analysis. This was also the overall experience with single polymeric stenting as reported in a review by El Samra. Short-term follow-ups, failure rate of 19 to 44%, and recommendation to replace the stents every two to three months. This disappointing result led to the rationale to use two parallel stents that potentially may offer better resistant to extrinsic compression, assuring four compartments for uh, urinary drainage, two intraluminal and two extraluminal. The pioneer of double stenting were Liu and Hribinko, who in 1998 reported their experience with four patients treated by double 4.7 French stenting, all of them patent at six months. The available literature suggests that insertion of double internal stents is feasible, safe, and superior to a single stent <clears throat> in the short term. El Samra et al. reported a success rate of 87% in a series of 34 patients with double internal stenting using double six French stents who were followed up for a median period of 23 months. However, the mean replacement time was only 4.3 months in this series. The Kaplan-Meier analysis of survivals outlined again the longevity of these patients with advanced malignant disease. More than half of them were still alive after one year. In a recent study, Highflo reported on a series of 81 patients with a success rate of 73%. Despite a short-term uh, median follow-up, the others identified two independent prognosticators of failure, 
metastatic disease and percutaneous nephrostomy at the time of stent insertion. Our group took the double stenting approach one step farther with the intention to reduce the number of stent replacements per patient, we adopted Percuflex, an advanced copolymeric stent with a manufacturer warranted dwelling time of 12 months. Its structure is characterized by repeated sequences of polymers with different chemical structures. This product was initially manufactured by Microvasive, which was assimilated by Boston Scientific. While many studies have focused on short-term experience with double internal stenting, we report the long-term outcomes of patients treated for malignant ureteral obstruction by means of yearly, every 12 months, replaced double internal stent. In comparison to other materials, Percuflex has a high tensile strength, meaning good resistance to external compression. The best internal external diameter ratio, meaning the best potential internal flow. A high coil retention strength, meaning reduced risk of migration. A relative low coefficient of friction that allows smooth insertion. It should be mentioned that this comparison was done with the regular Percuflex stent. In practice, we use the Percuflex Plus stent with the hydroplast coating that has the characteristic of the lowest friction group. Percoflex is highly radiopaque, fact that facilitates fluoroscopic guidance. In addition, clinical reports and device retrieval studies showed that Percoflex provide good biocompatibility and will not suffer significant degradation for as long as two years. Our technique for double stenting implies retrograde pyelography in order to visualize the segment of obstruction, followed by balloon dilation. You can note here the tortosity of the fully inflated balloon because the external forces on the ureter, double guide wires, and then parallel simultaneous insertion of the stents. Each stand seven French <clears throat> under fluoroscopic uh, guidance. So once the stands are curled in the renal pelvis and then in the bladder, we are done. Patients are follow up, up every three months and the stands are replaced at one year. In our series, the leading cause for obstruction was colorectal cancer, followed by gynecologic malignancies. Patients presented mostly with hydronephrosis, pain, renal function deterioration, and infection. One quarter of them had previous radiation, 23% presented with the pre-inserted nephrostomy tube, and 24% with a single J. Initial balloon dilation was needed in half of the patients. We demonstrated 100% feasibility with a success rate of 82% defined as replacement at 12 months. The median replacement per patient was one and the disease specific survival 21 months. Our multivariate analysis defined balloon dilation and EGFR smaller than, GF, than 60 as independent predictors for early mot mortality and EGFR lower than 45 and history of radiation as independent predictors of failure. On the left side, the, Kap the Kaplan-Meier analyzes for the stent failures, six cases that failed in a median time of 15 months. On the right, 
the disease specific survival showing a median survival of 21 months. You may depict that 45% of patients were alive at two years, 35% at three years and 25% at five years. So these this patients have to be drained for a long time. There are colleagues preferring to use metallic stents for the treatment of malignant ureteral obstruction. I must confess that I do not have personal experience with those stents and I have reservations, possible subjective, regarding their biocompatibility, ease of insertion and replacement, and patency time. The most popular stand in this group is Cook's Resonance, designed as a spiral without internal lumen. On the market, there is also the Silhouette stand by Applied Medical, which has a metallic spiral, which reinforced a polyurethane wall. Reviewing the literature with the aid of Samuel Samra again, I must say that the results are mediocre. Short follow-up studies, high rate of failure, and complications. And if resonance is so effective, why should we pay twice for a tandem resonance procedure as this group did, achieving a median duration of 123 days. Another type of metallic stents are the metal mesh stents. They are deployed in the area of obstruction by self, balloon, or thermo expansion. Experience and results, I must say, limited and again, mediocre. So if I have to choose, I'll go for an advanced polymeric double stenting. For $100, 30 minutes operating room once a year, I'll make happy the patients as well as the medical system. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Mario. That was, that was nicely presented. And I think uh, most of us are not wearing the uniform that you showed, but then, yeah, that is the way to go today. Um, that was really clearly put, and I think benign and malignant both are two different entities. So both of you have really shown us clearly it's so difficult and different to manage both of them. But if everything fails, the, the only option we have is to then go to Dr. Gumas and then ask him to show us how does he handle his cases where both intrinsic and extrinsic stenting fails, and we have to take a detour. So Dr. Gumas, all to yours, please. Okay, thank you very much for the kind uh, invitation. So I will talk about the management of complex ureteric structures uh, with uh, the uh, ureteral bypass, the tour system. Uh, this is a paper that I just noticed uh, published uh, uh, some month uh, ago, uh, talking about percutaneous nephrostomy and obstructing pelvic malignancy uh, that does not facilitate further oncological treatment. This is an interesting point of view because they studied uh, 105 patients with malignancy and obstruction of the ureter. 60% uh, had anti-grade stent, 38% had 40% uh, had nephrostomy. And there was a stent failure in uh, almost 30% um, of cases. Now, most of the patients up to 70% spent 20% of their remaining lifetime in the hospital due to nef the nephrostomy or stent-related morbidity, and only 30% continued with the scheduled chemotherapy. So uh, also the medium cost of these procedures, and uh, due to the fact that they have to get hospitalized uh, again and again, is around 13,000 uh, uh, pounds. So it seems like even if creatinine improves after the nephrostomy or the stand, the complications and the quality of life issues make the urinary diversion useless and an agony. So this is an alternative in, search, in certain situations, it's not for everyone. It's a subcutaneous urinary diversion that reestablishes the connection between the renal pelvis and the urinary bladder. It's a tube that goes from the kidney to the bladder but it is internal, it is an internal derivation. 
so there's no external drainage, avoids the ureter, so sometimes there is no ureter, it's impossible to, to put a stent in. And the only solution is an anephrostomy, especially in patients with uh, oncologic uh, pathologies. It has a very large lumen, that means that improves the drainage. It has a low pressure vesicle ureteral reflux and reduces the incrustation and is, and is permanent. Now, the first report was uh, from a French uh, group in Paris in 1993. Um, I saw the presentation of, of uh, Professor Sofer and um, what he said in the beginning of his presentations that nowadays we're dealing with uh, the chronic oncologic patient, it is uh, something uh, very important because imagine we have some also gynecologic um, uh, patients, that, that young patients that uh, survive even more than five years and they are condemned to a bilateral nephrostomies. And we're talking about 40, 45 years old uh, uh, women. So uh, in 1993, the oncologic patient was completely different from what we see nowadays. And I think that's why I uh, began to uh, search for a solution for this kind of patients. And uh, I found uh, uh, this solution for, uh, not for everyone, but for certain patients. So it's uh, two coaxial tubes uh, in one. It has an external PTFE um, tube and an internal silicon tube. The external tube has a almost 30 friends diameter and the internal tube, it's, it has a 17 friends diameter. The length, of course, it is adjusted uh, depending on the patient. And the only radio pack uh, portion of the, uh, of the device is at the proximal end. This is what you get with the set. It is, uh, uh, you find the 30 friends amplot sheath you find the bypass and you find a tunneling device that you can use it in order to create this subcutaneous tract. The indications are number one, impassable ureteric stricture or complete disruption of the ureter. So the patient has a permanent nephrostomy, failure or complications or intolerance of other treatments of ureteral stricture or lesion, and uh, when uh, the reconstructive surgery is inappropriate. Sometimes uh, we and other groups have used it also in benign lesions, and it can broaden the choices available for patients requiring long-term urinary diversion. This is the German group it's the group that had uh, the biggest experience uh, in the world. Uh, this is their for first uh, report uh, in, uh, with 40 uh, detour bypass in 31 patients. So as you can see, their indication was benign in 55% of the cases. And on 45% of the cases, it was used due to obstructing ureter from malignancy. These are the reports in the literature. And uh, as you can see, for example, a benign indication, let's say, it is the transplanted kidney, where we have a ureteral stenosis, sometimes very long. And uh, there were some groups that they used it. So we have also an idea uh, how it is to implant a ureteral bypass in a single uh, kidney and it works. Um, the rate of the explant due to infection or other problems is around 12%. This is the latest report. It's a group from England. Uh, it is published on March 2019. Uh, 20 detour were implanted in 13 patients, five patients bilateral. The primary indication was ureteric obstruction or injury uh, in oncologic patients with a medium follow-up of 12 months. 
Now, the fundamental requirements in order to uh, put a detour, to make a detour, is to have a normal bladder function. And of course, you're not supposed to have an active urinary tract infection. So in patients that have a neurogenic bladder, severe obstruction of the lower urinary tract, bladder tumor, bladder malignant infiltration, bladder fistula, untreated UTI, or untreated renal stones, we cannot place a ureteral bypass. Many uh, colleagues, they're asking me, what about the reflux? Because when you see the tube, it is really large. And uh, actually, it is also uh, longer than the ureter because the, the subcutaneous tract is pretty long. So if we apply this uh, in physics with the Poiseuil law, we understand that the longest and the wider is the uh, lower the pressure inside the system. So it is a, clinific a clinically insignificant uh, reflux. Uh, there are some precautions. There are patients uh, that uh, many of them are fragile. They're aged, oncologic, that they just had chemotherapy or that they had previous radiotherapy or, and they have, because they have chronic nephrostomies or stents, uh, frequently they have urinary tract infections. Almost all, all of them had uh, many previous abdominal uh, surgery some of them with radiotherapy, that means that we find we can find the frozen pelvis and this can be uh, very, very uh, important because they, you risk uh, some serious complication. So the technique is there are three steps. Uh, first, we have the renal percutaneous access. If the uh, patient has a nephrostomy, of course, we use this tract or we create a new one. And then there is the subcutaneous tract creation, and then there is the bladder access. There are some uh, moments of the operation. Uh, we have to dilate the tract up to 30 francs, and then we have to prepare carefully the detour, especially the, uh, the proximal end, as you see, the silicon tip that goes inside the kidney. We have to adjust the length of the tip in order not to get it too much inside uh, because it can kink and also it can be encrusted the external uh, sheath, let's say, of the, of the detour. So this is a moment where we have to waste some time. It takes around five to 10 minutes uh, to make the pyelography and understand exactly uh, which is the correct tip length. And uh, after uh, this, uh, we uh, proceed in the uh, final control. We extract the abstract and the stand, the bypass is self-retaining. It is like a vascular prosthesis if you touch it. So it is self-retained from the uh, renal capsule and uh, the muscles. And you don't need any suturing of the device in the nearby, on the nearby tissue. Then uh, we proceed uh, with the bladder isolation and with the tunneling. This can be really tricky sometimes because some patients, I, as I told you before, they have uh, a lot of uh, scar tissues and uh, especially in gynecologic cases. Uh, where the peritoneum is left open and you can find uh, the bowel stuck on the bladder. So you have to be really, really careful. Uh, we have to uh, isolate the dome and the lateral wall of the bladder where we want to insert the detour. And then we create the subcutaneous tract. That means uh, uh, we go just above the muscular fascia, as you can see here from the bladder and uh, then we insert the tunnel device until we go out uh, on the small lobotomy of about two, uh, two centimeters that we have done. And then we pass the detour in the subcutaneous tract and we have it on the bladder side. Then we have to adjust the length 
Here we have to be very careful in the kidney uh, to avoid any kinking of the device. So we double check it. And once we are uh, done, uh, we have to adjust the, um, the length and uh, put the detour inside uh, the bladder. We do a one centimeter uh, cystotomy and then we use uh, four absorbable uh, sutures. We usually uh, use two zero of Vicryl. If the bladder is a little bit thick, we can use also zero. We adjust the length. Uh, there is a slight angulation before entering the bladder. This is correct. Uh, we calculate two, three centimeters of the tip that enters the bladder. And then we have to uh, just uh, take out, uh, take off the, the external uh, part. So only the silicone tip will go inside the bladder. And here is where we put the uh, the sutures. So the sutures, actually, we put them uh, on the PTFE uh, covering. We do some also extra holes uh, for better drainage. As you can see now, we are ready to uh, make the anastomosis and we pass the sutures only on the external uh, part of the device. Then we uh, ligate everything, the anastomosis is complete, and we close uh, the incision. Also the fascia, we just leave a very small uh, hole where uh, the detour goes inside the bladder. This is the cystoscopic view, as you can see, on the dome. So usually uh, patients, they don't uh, feel the, the device. The final cystography, you see if I push with pressure, I, I have a reflux, but I really have to do it with high pressure. We leave the blood catheter for uh, one week and uh, then uh, we take out the catheter and the patient is without the nephrosum. This is the external view, so in, especially if the patient is thin, you may see it, uh, the, the subcutaneous uh, uh, bypass but usually it doesn't uh, bother the patient at all. Uh, these are some uh, complications uh, uh, reported in the literature. Uh, the encrustation is about 10%, asymptomatic uh, bacteriuria also. Um, it can be frequent and explant uh, ratio rate, uh, rate around 12%. Um, if we go and see better the report of the German group, we see that they had 10% uh, Clavian 3 complications, uh, early complications, and up to 37% Cla Clavian 3 uh, as late complications. This is the English group that I told you before, that they had also one death due to sepsis after a bowel perfor perforation in frozen pelvis. And um, the others, uh, there were some infections also. The quality of life it was uh, studied, this, uh, this part, and uh, there are two reports, uh, one in uh, 2007 and one in 2012, uh, and they both demonstrated a significantly improved uh, quality of life. And you, I think it is logical. I mean, the patient without the nephrostomy lives better. This is our experience. Uh, we have done 24 cases, three patients bilateral, uh, 15 cases with uh, palliative uh, indication, 14 had nephrostomies, and 10 failed stents, uh, with a median follow-up of 22 months. We had a bigger explant rate uh, than the literature, around 20%. That means two patients out of 10. And uh, mm, three patients, they had infections. They just had chemotherapy. And uh, one patient had, uh, unfortunately, an infection from the other kidney that infected the, 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 the 
the bypass. And um, the encrustation is around 4%. And we had the same complication with one death after one year with a, a female patient due to complications after bowel uh, fistula on the detour uh, and uh, subsequently sepsis. So 4% of uh, Clavian 4 and deaths due to malignancy and progression of the disease in 8% and the detour was functioning. So concluding that the bypass, it can be an alternative option compared to a permanent external drainage or JJ stent due to malignancy with ureteral obstruction. This is a palliative uh, indication. The quality of life significantly improves in patients with malignancy and nephrostomy. It can be sometimes um, considered as an option in uh, benign uh, uh, cases where other treatments fail. The technique is not simple. It's not, it's not like inserting a simple nephrostomy or a JJ stents. It combines a percutaneous access, a creation of a subcutaneous tract, and a mini laparotomy with cystotomy. Serious complication rate is low, but still not negligible. Accurate patient selection and preparation is imperative. In our experience, a female patient with previous radiotherapy is of high risk of complication. And there is a risk of infection and accrustation, so appropriate patient counseling and meticulous follow-up is imperative. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gumas. Um, first of all, I would like to just thank all the speakers. They were great talks. And everybody covered a really a unique perspective on each of the topics that was given to you. Um, for the questions, we have plenty, but I've just sort of selected a few, which I think will uh, reflect the talk that was presented today. Uh, maybe, Dr. Goma, since you just, uh, let's start with you. Um, what I think we would like to know is, uh, what is your patient when you counsel them, as in when you see a patient, which is the patient that you tell them, look, I think now you would benefit from a detour rather than double stenting or anything that, you know, Dr. Mario said. So until now, until now, um, I can say from the 24, so there were around uh, 21 patients, some uh, because some were bilateral. Uh, 19 patients, they were referred to me. So they were asking me uh, desperately for a solution because uh, we're talking about dramatic uh, stories. The patient comes to you and tells you, please um, take out the nephrostomy for me, for me, or this. Uh, in two cases, I decided because there were cases in my hospital, and th the last case I did, it was a single oh. kidney uh, gynecologic. Um, patient uh, that I decided uh, first uh, we put an nephrostomy and uh, of course I because there were no ureter ureter is not possible to put anything in so I uh, uh, of course uh, uh, say to the patient that uh, this could be a very valid uh, solution especially in uh, naive patients where they come to you, they don't have chronic nephrostomies, they don't have a story of uh, chronic urinary tract infection. Uh, and uh, I think they risk also less complications. So I just consulted them and um, usually they agree. So, so, so I think being a tertiary referral center to you specifically because you're subspecialized uh, to one of the few people, I think, in the world who does this at this point of time. Um, yes. There is, also, uh, there is also in Poland, uh, Dr. Vrona that has placed around 40. Yes. And uh, we're trying to make a multi-international uh, uh, study now. We will have to gather all our cases. Just curious, uh, how long did it take you uh, personally, in your learning experience, before you can, you know, confidently say, "Okay, I'm fairly good at placing this now." After five cases, after five cases, I went to Germany uh, in uh, Heidelberg uh, in order to see the German group. 
but they are a little bit close mentality. They don't want to share easily their um, their cases. No offense, eh? They are great guys, but um, yeah, I understand you. <laughs> no, it's a pity because they really had had uh, the biggest experience uh, of all. True. And now we are uh, trying to collaborate with uh, some uh, uh, in Sweden that I went to train them and uh, with Poland. And lastly, if, when I saw your presentation last in Challenges of Endurology, uh, there's a slight difference in the technique that you have shown this time in your video. Uh, is, there, is there something that you modified? Yes. With your I Yep. Yes, that's very, very good uh, observation. Now, I'll tell you honestly what I do and what I say to the patient. I begin from the bladder. Uh, if, I, if I have, prob after this experience, tra uh, tragic experience, dramatic experience with the uh, lady that I had the bowel fistula, she had a frozen pelvis, so I decided to um, begin from the bladder. In that case, I really had difficulties isolating the bladder. I had to isolate the intestine. It was all packed. And now I begin from the bladder. If I have uh, big problems, I abandon the procedure. So this is the first step. Then I do the, uh, if I isolate the bladder with no problems, and I'm pretty sure that the bowel is away, then I proceed with the percutaneous uh, part. Okay, so it's 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 a reverse order. Just make sure that the yes. lower part. Can go. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think it's a very specialized area, and a specialized patient probably deserves this. But Dr. Mario, when when you put your uh, patients on uh, the dual stenting, which you said, how long do you leave them before you bring them in for a change of stent, or you decide enough is enough for this patient? Uh, some of them, even though malignancy, they, they have long lifespans. Um, yes. yes, we have uh, patients that uh, were treated uh, with five or six replacements already. And it's very interesting, and I would like to provoke Armin uh, about the question of uh, percutaneous nephrostomy tubes and quality of life. Uh, because in our serie, 25% of our patients presented with... Um, uh, pre-insertion, pre-stent insertion percutaneous nephrostomy tubes. So they experience this kind of drainage and then they experience also the irritative symptoms and all the other side effects of the stents. And none of them uh, wished to, to go back to the nephrostomy tubes. So this is, a, this is a, the quality of life regarding the um, difference between the stenting and the uh, percutaneous tube, I think it's uh, still debatable. And I personally believe that for a patient who is already ill, um, uh, feeling free uh, without external tubes is much better than uh, experiencing some of the irritative symptoms of the stents. But 83% of our patients are replaced yearly, once a year, which I think it's a great progress. Yeah, 83% is fantastic. Uh, is there some, is, do you do kind of a check for the patency of this tent during the course of the year? We have fed them every three months with creatinine, urinary culture, and the KUB just to rule out incrustations. If the right. creatinine is stable, and uh, the patient is asymptomatic in terms of uh, infections, we continue the follow-up every three months. And at, at one year, we replace the stents. All right. That, that's, that's a fairly um, systematic follow-up and a wonderful follow-up. That's why the patients do so well. I, I'm just going to jump straight before I come to uh, Saeed with the, all the questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Ben, that was a very uh, beautiful current presentation. Keeping the whole talk today, um, if you have to tell us, um, is there something like a stent which can be ideal for just routine urotroscopy, better for benign strictures, better for malignant strictures? What's your take on that? You know, I think right now, you know, there's this uh, saying that a stent is a stent is a stent. There are some very minimal complications and no one's done a very big head-to-head -head study 
right now of all the stents that are available. So I can't recommend one stent than another. We have stents by Bard, Cook, uh, Boston Scientific at, at our site. And, um, you know, I, I can't really say that one is better than another. Um, you know, there are the ones that, that you know, Dr. Sofer's talked about, Dr. Uh, ben Henry has talked about in terms of metal stents and things like that are reinforced for malignant strictures. But really, um, right now, the data suggests there's nothing. There, there is some data, you know, to suggest that the silicone stents or silicone material anyway is more biocompatible. Um, but for some reason, they haven't really been widely, widely adopted. I think that new Imogen stent, uh, like the one that Dr. Ben Henry showed where he put the polyurethane stent in one and then the, the silicone stent and then there, there was no incrustation on the silicone stent. I think there is some validity to that that we should look at, but I think we need more data and to see it used more. But to answer your question, there's not really a, a, a good answer for that. And, and you know, sorry, please go on. I was just just uh, going to add to that is uh, in these strictures. Do you think? Uh, I mean, it was highlighted that probably keeping a bigger stand really helps. So uh, typically, most of the companies make stands which are like seven French, uh, especially like you mentioned, Cook's Black Stand and uh, uh, most of the yeah. other stands, even the Bard stands, which they say keep them uh, for you know longer time. They are usually seven French. Is that a good enough diameter or should we be considering just keeping a small stent because ultimately it's passive dilatation, which really helps. So those uh, studies that had the 4.7 French stent, even with the mini j fill stent, which is really just the uh, polyethylene um, suture, those basically said they were, they were dilated as well too. I think it's the irritation of the material that actually causes the dilation and not necessarily the diameter of the stent. We've certainly done some experimental studies in pigs looking at different types of prototypes and leaving um, stents with just uh, sutures or even bits of guide wire as part of it too actually causes quite a bit of ureteral dilation. So I think it's the irritation, not the diameter. So maybe the diameter, the study showed that the smaller diameters result in less irritation for the patients, um, but certainly the dilation I think would be very similar. So. I, I don't know. There's not been any really good studies looking at it, but I, I would say that it probably doesn't matter what diameter stent you leave. But in terms of strictures, I, I'm not sure. But certainly, um, you know, Dr. Ben Henry said that there was, uh, Dr. Sage said there was some, some evidence to leave bigger stents. Yes, Dr. Basker, you, uh, you were asking, please. Sorry, Ben, I just wanted to say, you know, what is an ideal stent? If we had to leave one, ideally you don't leave one, but if you had to leave one, something that can dissolve within a few days and you can just leave it, forget about it. When, do you think it will ever become a reality or do you think it's just a myth and we can never really have a truly dissolving stent? So we're, we're very close. I mean, when I did those eight patients with that first in human study, I was very nervous because I know in the other um, study that was done a few years ago, just a couple of patients had some stents dissolve and actually cause obstruction of the distal ureter. But with this stent, all eight stents dissolved. One took a little bit longer, but more importantly, uh, none of them had to get a, another stent put in. None of them had to go back to the operating room. None of them required cystoscopy removal. So I was very happy about that. So I think it's actually very close and we're getting close to FDA approval for the stent. And um, I think it will work. Now it does take between one to three weeks to degrade. But um, now in terms of the symptoms, we did a very rudimentary symptom questionnaire and it seemed to be comfortable, but I, I don't think that our data and plus our sample size is very small, but I think it will be more comfortable just because it's so soft. Great, I, I think that's nice. I, I, I think this, this question of an ideal stand would be perfect if an ideal stand really came, but you know, everybody is different and then every situation is different. Uh, with that, uh, Nikita, your presentation was really, really nice. Um, do you have uh, any first-hand study information or are you doing something to do with stenting in uh, patients before uh, intrarenal surgery? Because I think that's the, the current trend is we always wondering how long do we stent the patient before we do an intrarenal surgery? Two weeks, three weeks, or you know, support with alpha blockers? Um, I mean, the question is to Dr. Nikita, and everybody is please welcome to give their opinion on that. Um, well, we haven't done any studies, but I know there was a paper that was published in the BJUI that said that anything longer than four weeks pre 
of ureteroscopy has a higher risk of sepsis. Um, we are not at the moment looking at pre ureteroscopy stenting, um, but yeah, that's uh, quite a recent paper showing that. Uh, we, we had a paper from Singapore and my friend mentioned two weeks is uh, too long and they feel that two weeks is usually enough. What about you, uh, Said? Do you routinely keep your patients for two weeks or longer or, or it's just um, what exactly determines how long you want to keep your patient on a I think, I think nothing clear here, uh, Vineet, because the thing here that in animal pigs, they prove that the three days is enough. So on the human being is seven days enough. I have done some cases, seven days to 14 days is enough. If you go beyond one month, you have a great risk of sepsis as Nikita said. So many, in, uh, many paper uh, in the literature said that if you have kept it more than 15 days, like one month, you have a risk of sepsis like 10% or 20%. So three to seven days is enough for the dilatation of the ureter. I think so. And, and uh, Dr. Basco, do you advocate giving antibiotics to these patients who have been stented before in RIRS, uh, even in a culture negative? Or um, generally, what do you feel, sir? I, I would normally, for any ureteroscopy as a routine, we would, as a protocol, obviously check the culture, etc. But I would routinely give uh, antibiotic and induction and anesthetic. And that usually for us varies between three to five milligram per kg body weight of gentamicin, unless there is a problem. We go with three, but if it's a high risk case, and the high risk would be if they're pre stented for longer than a month, if there's a high stool volume, then we might go with five. Uh, but we would always routinely give an antibiotic on the induction of anesthetic. Yeah, because and I think most people in UK, I think most people in UK do. So, yeah. Okay. We, I feel there's an absolute misuse of antibiotics just because you keep a stent inside. People tend to give them tamsulosin for stent symptoms and then antibiotics as well, or maybe for a week or 10 days before surgery. So that's, that's nice to know that uh, the practice is actually at induction is good enough. And, and Saeed, you, you, you okay, showed some... Just wanted to yes, add yes, a quick thing. Is that um, I don't think you can make a rigid protocol as to whether you need to give antibiotics for each and every case. The yes. problem is that the urine sample that you get is usually the midstream urine. And the infection that the patient might get and the urine from the kidney would not necessarily have a linear correlation with each other. And that has been a biggest problem in some of the patients or some of the studies that have looked at the bacteriology of different urine samples. There is no uh, straightforward relation. So many times these antibiotics might be unnecessary. However, in some patients, they might be quite useful. Yes, I, I think that's true. The, that adds to the complexity of stenting because we, we really don't know what is a really correct answer most of the times. But I think it's, it's a, in a patient who's in an uncomplicated uh, like Nikita pointed out, maybe surgery. For sure, we know you don't really have to do too much after the surgery. Preoperatively, a simple stone uh, standing, which is kept for a week. Patient is doing very well, no fever. I think giving an antibiotic then is probably just to allay your fears rather than treating anything specifically. Uh, but, you know, Saeed, the, the, the videos were great. I, I think you were trying to emphasize that the use of energy today is probably responsible for the injuries caused and the stricture that subsequently develops. And, and it was beautifully said that approaching the stone with a laser is not the problem, but the misuse of that. And um, do, do you routinely, uh, because you, know, you have so many people training with you, do you routinely train them on management you know, uh, before bringing them to the patient? Or what are your tips and tricks over there, which you tell the, uh, your students? Because we have quite a few people who've logged in who are residents. Well, I just tell them that the ureteris have been insulted. If it's impacted stone, do not harm it, yeah, harm it more. So do not re-insult it again and again. So if you have impacted stone, just hit it from the center to the surface. Take it as a soft surgeon. If you have a stone migrated, go with the flexible, take it out. If you don't have a flexible, you put a double descent and come back again because the ureter with the impacted stone is re-insulted. So you cannot put an insultation to it with the lithotropsy, whatever the method, like lay, lay pneumatic or the laser. So I think the most 
common cause of the of the ritual structures of the problems that the surgeon when when I get rid of the stone and that he is under pressure of the patient because the patient wants to get rid of results but eventually the results should be in the hand of the surgeon so the message here that do not re-insult it again in, so in case of impacted stone laser so here I advise every surgeon here to get to the laser you have a 20 watt, 30 watt. You don't have to have a 100 watt. 30 watt is enough. So this is the message. The laser comes here to help you uh, to reduce the retrobulgion, to have a much more better income, and uh, to, re uh, to reduce the insult of the ureter. So to the, uh, the second the question that came in with this was, uh, if I have an impacted stone, and I have a renal stone as well, uh, should I just, you know, decide to go PCN straight away and not try? It's a proximalitic stone. Just go for a PCN straight away. Don't, don't, depends don't bother the, RIR. The stone size, depend the size of the stone, the kidney. I don't know what the size of the stone, the kidney. So if, um, well, it, that was not mentioned, but uh, assuming if you have a uh, one, and one centimeter impacted stone in the ureter mm -hmm. and one centimeter stone in the you kidney. You have a 60 millimeter in the kidney. So you just yeah. put, a, put a stent because the kidney is already in that pressure. So there is a hydronephrosis. If you go with the pressure and you go, you're gonna harm the kidney. Just reduce the pressure on the kidney. Let the patient go and have some um, double G stent for a while for 15 days and bring him again, you will find that kidney is very forgettable and very forgiven for you. And you will have that stone and the impacted stone with the easy way. So any hydrophoresis, I advise people with impacted stone to put a double G stent to reduce the pressure and reduce the insult of that kidney. So a stage procedure is much better, always. Dr. Fineet, I, I, would, uh, I would also, I think I understand the question as well too. And I think it's actually not a bad idea sometimes to tackle the stone from up top because um, first of all, you have a bigger kidney stone. If you do, we can treat that. But even for one and a half to two centimeter proximal ureteric stones, I prefer PCNL because you're coming from the bigger side. It's already dilated. And then I'm not going back and forth through the ureter. Sometimes you can even actually, if it's not really impacted, you can even remove the stone from that area. So you're not going over that area that's quite edematous and quite inflamed. So I, I think it's not a bad idea to tackle uh, proximal ureteric stones. I've also had some patients with distal ureteral stones who've had previous pelvic radiation. I think these patients are very susceptible to getting a ureteral stricture because the radiation is a terrible thing. And I've, I've seen a lot of strictures from that, from just retrograde ureteroscopy. You, you've been able to get up there a few times and then later on you're not. And when that happens, you've actually had to perform anti-grade ureteroscopy by doing a PCNL and then going down with their flexible ureteroscope and grabbing the stone. So sometimes even now, if people have had pelvic radiation, I'm even counseling them and actually doing an anti-grade PCNL um, basically prophylactically. So I think there is uh, definitely an option to do it. Doing stage procedure is always a, a good idea as well too. Um, but sometimes we don't, in some systems, it's a bit of a luxury to be able to put a stent up and then come back another time. So oftentimes I'll just do a PCNL and an anti-grade ureteroscopy as well too. Yeah, I, I, I totally sort of, uh, I think we have to decide on table or you have to look at the stone and the patient's condition. But I prefer also nowadays to just do a PCNL and put an anti-grade flexible scope to tackle the stone. Somehow I feel the decrease in intranial pressure probably helps. Uh, but yeah, I, I take, take your points, they're very valid, and these are the important questions which we need to tackle. Talking about PCN, uh, Dr. Arvin, uh, time for you to wake up. That was a great presentation there, but I'm just going to rake you a little more again. Uh, there was a very interesting question. They said, do you feel that a PCN and an infected kidney lowers the intrarenal pressure better than a stent? Do you have any evidence to that or any, any attribution to that? Uh, as far as the evidence go, those I don't have any evidence, but uh, on a personal front, I feel that definitely yes. If you put a percutaneous nephrostomy, the drainage is better in an infected system. And uh, in an infected system, particularly if you see good good amount of echoes, debris in the kidney, the preferred modality would be an percutaneous nephrostomy. But uh, suppose if you see on an ultrasound that there is some amount of mild mod mild hydronephrosis, but it's a clear urine that you are seeing inside, then probably if the obstruction is minimal and stenting would be an option. 
So if a definitive case like an emphysematous pyelonephritis, I think that that's one of those uh, infected systems where probably having a stent and a PCN both will be beneficial. Yes, in, a, uh, in an emphysematous pyelonephritis, I agree that DJ stenting might be an, uh, double J stenting would be an preferred option, uh, particularly if it is not having a pyelonephrosis. I, I used to actually put in two PCN tubes, one into the perinephric space, into the gas, and one into the system. But now I, I try to get uh, either me or the radiologist, we try to put one PCN into the gas and put a stent from below, and then look at all the other four or five parameters, and patients do equally well. Uh, how long do you think should you leave the PCN over there, just go clinically, or is there certain things which you look at before you decide I'm going to take it out? Uh, it, it will depend on the clinical condition of the patient. Uh, if you see that the clinical condition of the patient is improving, that is the most important parameter. Apart from that, definitely we will see that the total counts will go on, uh, on a decreasing trend. If the patient is having a deranged renal function, that will start improving. If suppose you are, you are seeing a kidney, which is a very poorly functioning kidney, uh, naturally that output from that kidney will start picking up. Uh, so these are uh, six, seven parameters which holistically you have to see together to make sure now now is the time that you have to remove the tube. And uh, do you think in an infected system, a bigger stent is better or again, uh, stents can get blocked, so a smaller stent is better. And any, any comments on that? Uh, I, I personally feel that a smaller stent would be better in an infected system because uh, uh, that would help in a better drainage. Yeah, especially with what Dr. Ben just mentioned, that's probably the passive dilatation. Yes. But again, it, the ureter is already inflamed and aperistaltic, so difficult questions to answer. But your presentation was very nice. Thank you on that. I'm, I'm going to trouble you, Dr. Doshi, to give us a little more information that after 2003, what's the next path-breaking uh, paper that you're coming with? Uh, like I, I, I was telling you, 2003 was when I was also training, and this was a fantastic uh, concept that you came out with. Is there something more that we've uh, built on and for us to look forward to soon uh, in, in the quality of life, especially for stents? Uh, uh, you may want to un kindly unmute yourself, sir. Yeah. Thank you. So, I think uh, there has been a discussion in terms of uh, use of a quality of life tool for all patients with ureteric renal stones and patients undergoing different interventions and can we have a, a tool like an IPSS for BPH that can be used for both the disease and the intervention. So a lot has been a lot of work was undertaken over the last five to six years to look at this because this is a very heterogeneous population. The stone disease is a chronic kidney condition in many patients with recurrent uh, disease, uh, the impact of interventions, all of it adding to the burden of, of the disease on the patient. And I, that has got in, impact in terms of how you measure their quality of life. So we have been working on this for a long time with different methodological experts and then have uh, developed a tool which would be a core tool for both the disease and the intervention same tool for both renal and ureteric stones and using uh, up-to-date psychometric methodology to address this problem. So it involved around 700 patients in terms of its development and validation. Uh, oh. So a lot of work, a lot of field tests were done and hopefully it will be published in the near future. Uh, that could be then used for any kind of study in this disease area or for all kind of intervention, new technology, existing technology, and be able to compare for all of that. Rishi, if I can come in. So with the STEM questionnaire, a lot changed, you know, people started using it and that was a way of communication, if you like, anyone with STEM, that's how we know how much trouble they had. Do you think with the quality of life kidney stone questionnaire, because at the moment, all we go on is clinical outcomes, no one talks about quality of life. Do you think that will be a game changer again in terms of uh, papers paying more attention to quality of life in patients with kidney stones? Uh, absolutely. As I explained, what are the sort of implications in terms of using a valid tool? And there are a lot many using uh, use of a tool for RCTs, for evaluative studies, for assessment of new technology, 
uh, using health economics in this, uh, all of this comes into equation and that also opens the door for better patient communication. And I think the key is uh, to know the tool is valid because uh, there is a belief that if you use uh, something that is published, the study gets valid. But if you take it nowadays for a proper study, take it to a methodologist, and if they look at the methodology used for each, like there are Cosmin guidelines that dictate what should be the quality of a prom. Similarly, if you take uh, the prom that can be used to a methodologist looking at the study, the RCT, the sample size, the statistics, they can look at the type of prom that is being used, what qualities it has got. And I think any prom has to satisfy those qualities. And that means there is a lot of background work that has to have uh, happened and also use of necessary expertise behind it, adequate sample size to come up with all of that. That gives a, a validity to any study that might use it as an outcome measure. So definitely. Okay, thanks. Wait, before, you know, that was very, very interesting. Uh, before we wind up and uh, Dr. Baska, I would uh, like you to give us the word of thanks. Uh, Dr. Ben, I, since so many um, uh, associations relate to, you, you know, they get back to you with how things are changing in the world of stenting, has COVID uh, made you change your about something in stents which you would like to convey to us? Yeah, so it, it's funny. COVID has changed a lot of things. The one thing we saw with our shutdown of our operating room for about three to four months was that patients were coming with worse renal function, higher grade of obstruction, and uh, in, a, in about th at least three cases, more um, encrusted stents. So I think we've tried to basically bump up all of our cases who were waiting for anything with the ureteral stent, stent changes or uh, obstructing stones with stents, just to try and reduce the amount of incrustation as well as the amount of um, infection as well too. Um, you know, there, there are some stents who claim that they have less incrustation uh, potentially, like for instance, the TRIA stent from the Boston Scientific. I think there's going to be, that, that's just only on bench studies, however. And I think there's going to be needing some more clinical data to really see if that's actually the case or not. But for right now, um, you know, I can't recommend one stent over another for those things, but just to basically make sure that we manage our systems and our wait times and our wait list uh, appropriately to basically include those patients with uh, indwelling stents to try and reduce these amount of complications. Yeah, I have a question to Dr. Baskar before we wind up. How long do you leave a stent for if it's a chronic condition? And how do you follow these cases in order to avoid a forgotten ureteric stent? Do you have a stent registry or a e application? Do you know, uh, Zishan, as you mentioned, I've recently come across one of the apps, which is called Eurostents app. And I know you are involved with that, but I'll tell you, I was reviewing that. And that is a wonderful way because with COVID, all traditional methods of communication, and this just shows that it can happen to anyone, anytime. So emails, letters, telephones don't happen. If you have an application, everyone has a mobile phone app now. If you can communicate with the patients via the app, where you can tell them, they can tell you the symptoms, you can. And it doesn't have to be one doctor, it could be a team. You know, you can have nurse specialists, uh, you can have registrars, consultants, and then you can tell them, and through that, they can communicate when they want to change the postpone, the, uh, you know, the, the timeline, change it. So I know that that is one way of, uh, you know, modern social media and uh, communication that we should use rather than historic stent registry. Because this way, when you have a app-based stent registry, it is very, very dynamic. It is not, you don't have to, you know, log in and this and that. You don't have to wait for an email. And I think that is a way forward when it comes to how you can look after stents. So well done on that, Zishan. So about uh, leaving a stent for longer, how long do you leave in case of chronic conditions? I, to leave it first long. of all, if you, if you want to leave it, if you have to leave a stent, I think if the reason is stent edema, you know, or edema of the ureter, then you might leave a stent on a string and take it out next day. If it's for very minor fragments or stone dust, again, two or three days is enough. 
if you have a urethric injury or if you have a real problem and you think, well, here I really need a mandatory indication, that would usually be some sort of minor or major urethric injury. Then you would leave it for either two or four weeks, depending on what happened. But for most of the things, stent or a string or something similar, then you don't have to leave for long. Two or three days probably is enough. Okay, thanks. Great, great. You know, can I just tickle Dr. Mario the last time before we wind up? That wonderful tweet that you put up two access sheets through the penis into the same patient and did bilateral urethroscopy. Did you stand those guys? <laughs> of course. It depends. If they are, if they are pre stented, I do not stand them uh, post operatively. Okay. So basically, ultimately... And otherwise, I stand everybody and I leave the stent for five days. Ask me, why five days? Why five days? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, thanks to everybody. But uh, Dr. Basker, please, um, we'd like you to give us the final comments and uh, thank everybody as well, please. Uh, it was really very enjoyable. Vineet, you put up a great show with Zishan. So well done to you and Zishan. And really well done to all the speakers. It was very informative, a lot of learning. Uh, special thanks to Nikita, to Yonis, to Mario, to Dr. Erwin, uh, Ben, of course. Uh, you know, it has been a great show. Saeed, I'm not forgetting you. You'll always be there with your videos. And Rishi, we're really looking forward to the new uh, quality of life uh, kidney stone questionnaire. Uh, last but not the least, I think we must thank the sponsors, Blue Neem, for helping us, and to Swarmin Touch for the tech support they gave us. But really, it was a really enjoyable session. Well done again, Vineet, Zishan, all the rest of the i team, and all the speakers. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. Have a great weekend, and thank you once again. See you all. Bye-bye.